Folks, we want to welcome you out to the school today. We're uh, happy to have you. We're having uh, uh, a few parking problems outside, apparently, and a few people having trouble finding the right building. But uh, I'm sure we'll be joined uh, very soon by the remainder of the people who are coming. We, uh, the fire marshals asked that I remind you that there is no smoking in the, in the main area of the building out here. There is a smoking area directly across the lobby from where you came in, in the stairwell. And of course, smoking certainly uh, available to you outside of the building. There also is a place in the basement downstairs, just, just to the left of the stairwell at, at the other end of the foyer downstairs. We uh, want to acknowledge the presence of our representatives from various companies out here in the foyer, as you've noticed. Uh, there's a lot of people that haven't been able to get past that point and into here, and they'll be joining us later. But uh, these are mini and micro system uh, computers that are adaptable to small businesses. And uh, Billings Computer of Provo, the bite shop here in Salt Lake, uh, Computer Room, NBI and Tektronix are those that are taking part in the demonstration today. We also would like to thank in advance uh, Mr. James Gardner and his staff uh, for the food preparations for lunch. You have a ticket that you should have picked up with your packet, and it says $1 on it. Disregard the $1. I think you'll find that the luncheon today will be a uh, far, greater, uh, far greater value than that. We'd also like to thank John Angewerden, who is with our food service students, who will be pre uh, preparing and serving the uh, refreshments at the refreshment break at 10.30. Also, our marketing department, uh, Lee Brockbank, uh, did a lot of help and uh, gave us a lot of help in letting you know about the, the workshop and in stuffing, preparing these uh, packets that you have. Um, you should have received a name tag, a lunch ticket, and your packet. Anybody here not get those things? Okay. Uh, I'd like to ask for a raise of hands uh, of those that are here. How many of you are now in a small business or contemplating one in the very near future? Okay, that's a, a good majority of those that are here. We... Uh, We would like to uh, start our uh, program today by having Dr. Dale S. Kogel, the president of Utah Technical College, uh, talk to you for just a minute. And then we have Mr. Richard Hagland, uh, a management consultant, and he will follow uh, the president directly. So we'll follow the program to that point. Thank you, Bob. Welcome to Utah Technical College. Delighted to see here, you here this morning. Glad that you're very good sleuths and can find a place in a parking place. I'm told there are no such things as parking places on campus. That's by people who don't like to walk very far. I'm pleased that you're here for this purpose of a small business workshop. Some of you might disagree about the magnitude of things, but uh, we usually consider ourselves to be a small business. Anytime we feel differently, we, we look at the University of Utah and Brigham Young and conclude we indeed are a small business. And we're trying to operate this place on business principles. Uh, the great many taxpayers are dubious about that, but the fact is that we are and we're pretty efficient. Uh, we have all the same problems that will be addressed here today at this place. We do indeed have to have successful managers, effective managers, to use the uh, resources we have. Uh, we try to do marketing and advertising, however that's a fine line for us to walk. Uh, if we advertise too well, it brings in more students than we're expected, and then we ask for more money from you. And so some people object to our doing any kind of advertising for fear that it will raise the enrollments and raise the tax money that's contributed. But I'd like to say to you that, as in any other business, we are trying to make a profit. It uh, turns out to be a little less direct, a little harder to measure, but it is quite clear that the return on investment to, in taxes from the people who are prepared here and go to work is greater than the taxes expended in the institution. So the profit comes that way. When the people finish, uh, even if it's a short term, they are more productive. They do make uh, 
more money and return more taxes to the taxes to the state. So this is a profit-making organization. I think that we can demonstrate that and we're quite pleased with that. We do have legal uh, concerns. Um, the state of Utah defines our organization and defines the legal constraints and, and uh, keeps us in line. I, I think that uh, any comparison of the constraints on a small business, uh, we probably have all of those and maybe a few more and maybe I ought to listen to this uh, seminar today for some of that under record keeping uh, regulations insurances taxes and licenses uh, some smart aleck at uh, college of uh, in southern utah made a list of the reports made to regulatory agencies by his institutions we've matched it over 290 a year and some of that 290 are repeated monthly and some quarterly and so forth so we understand that wonderful aspect of business also. And this uh, last uh, item here, uh, sources of capital and, and financial factors, uh, we don't have the freedom that you will have. Uh, we also don't have some of the restrictions that you will have in doing that. Our capitalization comes from the state. It's never what we want, uh, but then we're greedy, and I'll admit that. Uh, we always make very good use of it, and then we get chewed out because we spend it all. Um, so uh, we understand the capital and the financial factors uh, business to some degree, although uh, it, it, we do seem to be subsidized where some of you won't be. But again, uh, we return that subsidy as, a, as profit. Uh, we collect, we provide the profit and then we collect it to reuse it. The other thing I want to tell you is that the people who are preparing here to go into business some of the, the people here are students this morning, will make very, very fine additions to your businesses when you get around to growing some more. So I think as it uh, puts it so well at the bottom of this list, you've come to the right location to have a fine uh, seminar on small business management and particularly to get acquainted with the very people that you want to take away from here and steal from us to work for you in the future because they will be very productive people. So I'm, again, pleased to welcome you here. I thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. And now, if you'll excuse me, I need to go back to a class. They're on break while I'm over here visiting with you. Thank you. I'm pleased to meet with you this morning. Bob Cox asked a question as to how many of you are now in business or are planning to enter a business. I'd like to separate those two categories and ask how many of you are already owners or managers of a business? Looks like the major part of you. This program schedule uh, follows the pattern of most of the books on how to uh, begin and manage a small business by placing first on the list a discussion of personal qualities for success in small business. And I suspect that many of you are like the people that come up to the Small Business Development Center to see us at the university looking for help. They would rather get off that question and on to the question of how can I get some money to get my business going. Uh, and that's a natural uh, reaction, I suppose. But it is important, I think, to take a few minutes to talk about the personal qualities and capabilities that make for at least a probability of success in beginning and managing a small business. The books and the pamphlets uh, will, will make out for you a list of uh, personality characteristics, really, and it reads a bit like the, the uh, scout law, you know, trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, and so on down the line. Actually, those things are important, and uh, the characteristics that are talked about in these pamphlets and booklets that urge you to consider your capabilities before you do anything else uh, have a significance for you. No one's going to succeed in business without uh, initiative and drive. No one's going to succeed without a, a fair uh, portion of intelligence, uh, some skill in human relations, uh, a, a high sense of responsibility, these things are important. You've got to pay your bills. You've got to meet your customers when you tell them you'll meet them. You've got to be able to communicate with them. 
you have to have a certain amount of technical know-how with respect to the particular service or product that you're going to provide. You've got to be diligent, willing to work hard. You've got to have stick to perseverance. Uh, all of those things are significant in assessing the probability of success in your business venture. I think the one characteristic that sums up uh, best of all these personal qualities was demonstrated the other day in a client that came to, to talk with us about uh, a business that's already been in operation for a number of years, but happens to be now in deep trouble, very, very deep trouble, I might say. But the thing that was impressive was that this client had a hunger to make it go. The client had already been advised by a banker to forget it, to go get a job somewhere and do something different. Uh, that advice was uh, unacceptable in this situation. This client demonstrated, as I say, a real determination to find a way to salvage the uh, failing portions of the business and make it go. And of all the personal qualities and characteristics that are significant to the probability of success, I think, as I say, what I've called the hunger to make it go uh, is significant. If it's just a matter of wanting to be your own boss, then my advice would be forget it, do something different. Because that won't qualify for success uh, in relation to the real hard work, the real uh, necessity to learn as you go, to apply the things that you learn. Uh, those things are, are what are required in the way of personal characteristics. Now, beyond these personality factors, there is another I think, list of uh, characteristics, if you will, that are even more significant. And that's the competence to operate in the functional areas that are a part of every business, the operating areas. And without that competence, either part of your equipment as you begin the business or acquired as rapidly as you can acquire it uh, as you go along, all of the drive and energy and initiative and human relations skills that you might have uh, are not going to make a success in business. The functional areas in business are really three. And the first one, in my view, is marketing. And by marketing, I mean much more than sales ability. Marketing involves knowing who are the customers and where are they and what are they interested in and what price are they willing to pay and what kind of service do they want? Uh, all of those things are a part of the knowledge of marketing that are absolutely essential if we're going to have a successful business operation. Price, promotion, the various sales channels that are open to us, distributors, dealers, door-to-door -door selling, mail order, whatever it may be, all of those things are a part of the determination of the marketing plan and a business manager has got to de develop uh, competence in the skills of marketing. The second function that I would be concerned about would be the production function. And by that, I don't mean to limit it to manufacturing operations. Production is the, is the activity by which you make available to your customers the goods or services that you plan to provide. If it's a service business, uh, I would broaden the definition of production function to include the hiring and training and dispatching of the people who are going to provide the service. If it's a retail operation, the production function includes the ordering and stocking and displaying and eventually selling uh, the merchandise. It's the function of producing the product or service that you intend to offer to your customers. And the third function is the accounting and financial function, and it's the budgeting the planning and the record keeping and the analysis of those records so that uh, the business manager knows from day to day, from week to week, from month to month, uh, whether or not the business is succeeding and in what directions it's succeeding and in what directions it's running into trouble and how he can avoid trouble in the future, correct the troubles that may have occurred. And finally, there's a fourth function that's of major importance to each of you, and that's the management function. 
And that's the integrating and the balancing act that you do with these other three areas, the marketing, production, and accounting and financial functions, have to be integrated into an operation that is balanced, that is going forward from day to day, week to week, as I suggested, and uh, producing that uh, important bottom line that everybody talks about. It's the integration of the men and the money and the materials uh, that go to make up the business. If a manager is not competent in these functional areas, my advice to such a person would be, first of all, do some studying, get competent. Uh, that can be done on the basis of a, of a course. Uh, a seminar like this is helpful in outlining the areas for you and abstracting a certain amount of information so that you can tell what is involved in these various functions. But I think it's absolutely essential that a person learn something significant about how to operate in those three functional areas and then how to integrate them and make them all pull together to bring about a successful business. If you don't have that information, that kind of skill when you start, it's absolutely essential that you save part of your time apart from the operation of the business to begin to gather additional skills in those areas. And if you already feel that you have those kinds of skills, uh, let me suggest that they need maintaining and upgrading uh, from month to month because the conditions change, the techniques change, the necessity for different skills increases uh, from month to month. Now finally, if you can combine the personal characteristics and the competence in these functional areas, uh, I would say there is one other characteristic that's extremely important, although it's very, very hard to define. This is an intangible, but it's essential for real success. It's very hard to test for it in advance. Uh, it's hard to acquire it if you don't have it. But it's the key to real growth and real development, and that's an intuitive sense of what goes on in the business world. And I think if you look at the, the records of, of highly successful businesses, you'll find that the managers of those businesses have that intangible quality of being able to read, read and interpret rapidly changing situations and circumstances, the environments in which they operate, and to sort out of those changing environments the conditions that are critical for the particular business they're in. When you get into a business situation, you'll find that very often you have limited time for decision. The data that are available to you are ambiguous. They're uncertain. You're not sure what the answer ought to be, but you have to make a decision. And the ability to, as I say, intuitively understand the benefits of one decision as opposed to the benefits of another is highly significant. It's important to be able to recognize goals and to proceed toward them in a logical fashion and to have a, uh, a good plan. But that sixth sense that tells you, I don't have all the data, but I'm sure this is the right way to go, is the hallmark of a successful manager. So if we can combine the personal characteristics of initiative and drive, and human relations sense, and uh, ability to work hard and to persevere in the face of, of discouragement, with a competence in the essential functions of business operations and that critical, uh, intuitive sixth sense of what to do when the data don't tell you what to do, then I think the chances for success in business are greatly magnified. Thank you. to get up and take a stretch just started my name is Norman Morris I'm the promotion director at the ZCMI Center downtown uh, the uh, coordinator for this thought I was going to be a little late I do apologize for 
being here at 9.30 when I was supposed to be. Uh, we had a sev several things going on. First of all, my wife and family's been down sick for two days, so I've been uh, being a babysitter. And then this morning I had to go to work because we have Abraham Lincoln going on tour at the mall, and uh, we wanted to welcome him. Uh, He's pre being presented before a group of uh, 200 schools this morning at about 10.30, and I'll be here, so I hope it goes well. The, uh, I enjoy my job. I really do. I am the marketing manager at the ZCMI Center, which includes mostly advertising and promotion and so forth, and uh, my wife often reminds me how valuable I really am. She says that if all of the advertising men in the world were laid end to end, what a damn fine thing to keep them out of everyone's way. She also indicates that uh, a standard, standard uh, a joke in the industry is that 50% uh, of your advertising is no good, but no one knows which 50%, so you have to do it all. Well, my presentation to you this morning maybe 50% no good, but I don't know how to gear it to you. I don't know what your individual capabilities and capacities are. Uh, I have been asked to speak for four hours to you this morning, but I've condensed it down into about a 55-minute presentation. So I'm going to present most of it to you, fairly consolidated, give you a lot of facts, and I hope that you'll be able to pick out something that's important to you. Now, the first thing that I'd like to suggest to you, maybe it's already been covered, is the fact that right now you'll never have as much time as you do to spend on the tangibles and intangibilities of your potential enterprise. I suggest that the more that you plan before you open your doors for business, the better off your business will be. Now, I don't know if the impact of that hits you or not. If you're going into business, now is the time to plan. Because if you have time to plan after your business, you're already a failure. If you have any time left to do any planning after your business is going, you're a failure. Now is the time to plan to make that business get off of its feet. I suggest to you that it'll take approximately six months of heavy planning. A good business, a good business plan is the key to your future success. Even if you intend on starting a small business with only yourself to answer to, a written blueprint will enable you to anticipate and solve problems in how you're going to be organized, what you're going to do as far as the staff goes, what your marketing is going to be, and what your financing is going to be. A written plan will help you to understand that before you spend valuable time energy and money, you need to know if your business idea will in fact work. Maybe it's something that's exciting and stimulating to you and you have your ego wrapped up into it, but if it's not going to work, what's the real reason you're going into business? You need to, do, you need to know how much profit you stand to make. That's the bottom line. And exactly what procedures must be followed in order to manipulate the strings of success. So I suggest to you this written plan will stir you in the right direction. It will also form the proposal for plans to, uh, to banks and to uh, other potential investors. It will give you instant information if you have that plan for your accountant, for your lawyer, and any partners that you might be taking into the business with you. A detailed business blueprint can help you persuade suppliers also that you really know what you're doing. So I suggest that the first thing that you want to do is to have a written blueprint and, if you will, a business plan. And some of the things in my area that I'd like to talk about this morning is what should be included in that business plan as far as advertising, marketing, and the right location. I'm sure that all of you know that it's very foolish to take a, gun, uh, to take a shotgun approach to business aiming at the entire consumer population of Salt Lake City just isn't going to cut it if you're in business in Kearns. It's not, it's not wise to reach out as far as you possibly can and think that Ogden is going to be some of your market if you're in business in Salt Lake. 
This, this kind of umbrella targeting is, is termed, as I indicated to you, the shotgun approach. The rifle approach is what I'm suggesting. You should not aim at selling everyone. Locating subgroups within the population, consumers who share similar needs and wants and preferences, makes more sense. So I'd like to indicate to you there are several ways that you can, you can segment your market. One is demographically, D-E-M-O graphically, geographically, G-E-O graphically. Third is psychographically. Fourth is by benefits, and the fifth is by the usage of the product. Let me explain a little bit about that to you. Demographic segmentation. Is all of you aware of what demographic segmentation is? That is where you divide up the consumer market by age, sex, level of income, occupation, the nationality, the education level, the race, religion, and so on. Now, for instance, if you're going to open a Vietnamese restaurant, there ought to be some Vietnamese people or people that enjoy Vietnamese food, right? That makes sense. So your demographic segmentation, however that classification is getting rather old. We've had it around for 30 or 40 years. It's just not working. We're going to have to segment a little bit more than that, but that is de demographic segmentation. Another marketing technique is geographic segmentation. Obviously, Kearns is a little bit different than Cottonwood. Bountiful is just a little bit different than Provo. That, that's fairly understandable. One of the things that I'd like to suggest to you that you write down is psychographic segmentation. I'll spell that for you. P-S-Y-C-H-O-G-R-A-P-H-I-C. Some of you may know that this is how people are grouped according to their attitudes and their interests, their lifestyles, and other personality attributes. There's a lot of merit to this approach, particularly nowadays, where there's so much segmentation going on by people doing their, quote, their thing. Remember that consumers often select their products and stores as well. Did you get that? People select their products and their stores as well with personalities that are very much like their own self-image. Now we go to benefit segmentation. This is grouping people according to what kind of benefits they seek from a product. This is still another way. Automobile manufacturers are currently trying to decide what's the best way to do this. And that's why we have so many makes of automobiles. It's a very uh, easy thing to understand. Automobile manufacturers are now turning very much to the gas situation, whereas years ago they went very much to the looks and the sleekness and so forth. So. Automobile manufacturers have to constantly define, and they have to be aware of that years in advance. So this comes down to the local level as well. You need to know what benefits the customer is looking for. Also, how are they going to use it? You need to be able to define in Salt Lake City, if that's where you're going in the business, how heavy your product is going to be used. Uh, for people, if you're going into the air conditioning business, if most of the homes uh, or older homes in the area that don't have the appropriate uh, materials and so forth that uh, the new homes have, the, the forced air heating and so on, it's probably not a good idea to go into business in that kind of an area. So I suggest that the fir very first thing you do in starting your business is to determine those kind of segmentations and be able to honestly prove to yourself what the psychographics are, what the benefits are to the people, and how they're going to use it. Is the usage where you plan to go into business heavy, medium, or light? Now that takes us to our next uh, concept, and that's finding the right location. Up to this point, have I confused anyone? I see some wrinkles in your forehead big enough to carry half dollars in. Is that just because you're tired or asleep or bored? Is there any questions to this point? Okay. 
So I'm suggesting to you now that the, the point that we're up to is the selecting the place to set up your operations, and that is perhaps one of the single most important decisions that you'll ever make. Years ago, a wise old man that made a lot of money in business was asked the three things that you needed to know to go into business. He said the first was location, the second was location, and the third was location. More often than not, the seeds of your business failure, the seeds of your business success or failure will be sown in your choice of location. It's sad but true that many location decisions are based upon personal preferences or whim. Now, I understand that none of you folks would do that, but about 90% of all businessmen do it that way. Now, you're much wiser than that, and I'm obviously speaking to the wrong audience. Be aware of that. They do that instead of an objective, instead of an orderly approach to the decision, instead of the business plan that I was suggesting to you about earlier. A lot of times people will decide to set up shop close to home or in their home, or they discover a beautiful looking empty lot that they can get for just a real low down. Or it's along, it's along a busy thoroughfare and they think that's going to make them very successful. Well, I'm suggesting to you that perhaps uh, as this other gentleman just said to you, you're a little bit early to go into your intuitive approach. You need intuition, that's true, but I suggest that that intuition works hand in hand with a sound business practi uh, practices and principles. Emotional factors are not the way to stay in business if you don't have the business plan to work with. Now, I'm going to go into how to analyze for a retail store, so the rest of you can go to sleep if you're not going to go into retail. You're already asleep, right? <laughs> the, right choice of, the right choice of location for a retail store. I'm going to give you some things to write down, and it's going to take a while, but I appreciate if you would write them down. At least I'll be able to say they were taking notes, sweetheart. I saw them. They were involved with my lecture. But they're also very important. The first one that you'll want to consider is accessibility to transportation. Accessibility to transportation. However you want to write that down is all right. But the idea is, can people get back and forth to your business place? Another consideration is closeness to your market. Yes? Would this also be the same for a service industry? Such as? Uh, probably not as important, but it is a consideration. Mainly because if you're too far away, you transport both ways. You with me? And when gas is $2 a gallon next January, you all understand it's going to be $2 a gallon next January? Or before? Or before. Accessibility to transportation is when you have to, when you're a service truck, so you've got five service trucks out, and they spend $2 a gallon, and you have to drive 15 miles for your first call, you know, that's already $2. Okay. The next one is the closeness to your company's markets, which ties hand to hand in that. Closeness to your market. The third one, if I go too fast for you, let me know. As I've indicated to you, this is a four hour lecture in, in 50 minutes. Your cost factors, such as land, construction, materials, labor, and so on. Another thing that's very important that's often not considered is the local ordinances and regulations. That will become, I, I predict to you, that will become with this EPA and, and the, the uh, environmental thing that's going on very, very important to the businessmen of the future, depending on their type of business. Local ordinances and regulations. The next one is the quality of the local services, such as police and fire protection and so on. Uh, for instance, if, you, if you're on the boundary, uh, I won't give you the exact cities, but if you're on the boundary between several cities in Davis County and they have their jurisdictional dispute between their fire people and your building burns down because they can't agree on who's going to be the one to put it out, I'm sure you're aware that that happened about three years ago, aren't you? So you need to know that. That's important. If a fire starts and you're in the in chemical business and, and the fire starts, you need to know that somebody's going to put the damn thing out, don't you? 
The next one, sewers and water supply, power and other utilities. The next one, and I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt on this, I hope you're all very successful, space for future expansion. And then, very importantly, your tax structure. As prices go up, your taxes will, and that is a very important consideration. Now, I'd like to draw a little chart on the board. <coughs> this chart takes about an hour to explain, and I'm going to try to do it in about seven minutes is the time that I have allotted for it this morning. So if you'll work with me, I'd appreciate it. I'd like you to put A, B, C, D, E, and F along the side here. However you want to do that. Now, just assume that those stand for the, your location. Say that you're going into business. And we're looking at six tentative locations in Salt Lake, if that's where you're going into business. That's going to stand for each location, okay? The A through F, and that could go, that could be as few as three or on and on, all the locations that you're considering. Now the next down here, there's eight or nine, eight or nine uh, considerations I'd like you to list. These are also important if you'd like to write them down. Number one, the extent of the store's trading area. The extent of the store's trading area. You need to understand what a trading area is. It's the area surrounding your particular store, where you draw most of your shoppers. For instance, downtown, that trading area could be as small as three square blocks. Or if you're in American Fork, that in could include parts, major parts of two different counties. The next one to write down is the population characteristics. Population characteristics. Now, I gave you a little bit about that before, and I won't go into it. I, I'm sure you understand now that I'm just giving you a very brief outline that you'll have to fill the bones in yourself. The characteristics is that segmentation that I talked with you about before. Are they going to use your product where you're locating? Do pe will people use your product more in American Fork than they will in Bountiful? What are the psychographics of your product? Are they going to be any different in uh, Alpine than they will in Kearns? You see what I'm saying with that? You need to be able to understand the population characteristics, if they are in fact going to be benefited and using, and if they're the people that relate to your product and to your store. The next thing that's often not considered, especially in small business, is the nature of the competition. That's number three, nature of the competition. If you'll write these down, I'll tell you what to do with it in just a moment. Number four is the compatibility of your neighboring businesses. You can just write down business neighbors, if you like. If a store is located uh, in the shopping center industry in which I'm involved with. That is very, very important. One of the, uh, I, I won't go into all the details of this, but one of the very first malls that uh, were built in Salt Lake City has a market in it, a chain store, food store. And within the last six or seven years, it has been found that they are, they are compatible, but one doesn't bring business for the other. The food stores don't bring business for the mall. People go into the food store, out and home. They go into the mall, out and home. They just don't relate with each other. Wouldn't it be nice if you had stores like a uh, women's store relates very beautifully with a hairdresser shop? And that relates 
Those two relate very nicely with a shoe store, a women's shoe store. Do you see what I'm driving at there? If you're in those kind of businesses, make sure that you don't have a women's shoe store right next to Joe's Plumbing. Okay? The image just is not there. And I'm not insulting the plumbers. I'm just saying, make sure that your businesses go together. The next concept is parking facilities, and I really understand that. I really understand that. Parking downtown, just somebody didn't look at this very well when they put downtown together. But then on the other hand, we do pretty well. There's one major downtown shopping center in the United States that doesn't have a single, not one, parking stall. They rely on the perimeter parking. They, they're bussed in. So I guess when you compare it to that, we're doing well downtown. The next, if you're a retail store, and I indicated to you this would be primary retail considerations, is the avail availability of public transportation. More and more, with the, with the gas crunch, I take Route 41 to work, living over in Taylorsville, not too far from here. And uh, we're at the point now where we need three buses. Now, the bus company isn't going to provide that for us. You know that. But I'm saying that it's gone in a year from being half used to where that bus is completely full now. And that will increase as the gas crunch goes up. The next one. The next consideration is the volume of traffic, both pedestrian and vehicular. You're just not going to stay in business if you are a retail store if there is no pedestrian traffic walking by your store. There's been predicted that 60%, up to 60% of all retail goods are bought on impulse decisions. So if you're there and somebody's downtown and they're walking by and you have a sale going on or, or a sidewalk sale, you know, and it's 50% uh, off and you, the shoes are regularly $30 and you see they're really neat for 15 that's impulse buying, folks. And a lot of retail merchandise goes out the store with that kind of purchase. The next one to consider is the store building itself. And then the storefront, the fascia. If your store does not have a personality and you're trying to appeal psychographically to people, you're just not going to stay in business. Now let me run through how, what to do with this. You've written those all down. You have six locations you're looking at. There's a little graph to use here. The key to that is if you'll give one point for a poor rating, one point for a poor rating, two points for a fair rating, three points for a good rating, four points for a very good rating, and five points for an excellent rating. Okay? What I'm saying now is, as you go through and compare, just comparing the available locations with each other, just comparing the available locations with each other on each of these items, store A may be very poor compared to public transportation. But store C might be right next to a drop-off point which is a major access for the buses. So it ranges, all these items are rated from one to five for each one of these considerations. Now, I see some questions both asked and unasked. No, I'm going to get to that, and I appreciate you bringing that up. I'm trying to do this for my feeble mind. It's hard to, hard to explain in, unless I eat the elephant one bite at a time. Are you with me at, up to this point? Somebody say no, because I know that you're all lying. Do you understand it? Okay, good. Now, the, the, this gentleman brought up the very interesting point. 
A lot of us get to this, but what some of us do not realize is that there's one step beyond that, and that is that you need to give different weights to these items here. Your trading area size, your trading area size, what importance is that compared with these other considerations? Your competition, what importance is that compared with the other considerations? Now I suggest that you also give that a rating from one to five. You with me? If trading area is the most important thing to you, you give it a five. If it's the least important thing to you, give it a one. Now there may be more than one five and there may be more than one one. All I'm saying is compare in your mind for your business, and that's the question that was asked down here a minute ago, what about service? Well, the accessibility to the market may not be the primary most important thing, but for gas, it may be a number three. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Or it may be a number two. I don't know, but this is the way for every business to decide. Now, what you do then, folks, and this is the point that will lose you, you go through and multiply out like if this here for public transportation once again if item C is the very best of them all but if public transportation only rates a three for you in your considerations there you multiply that out and that becomes a 15 you understand that now, what happens is that when you do all of that, you come down with the rating for each location. Now, when one location rates 172 and another one rates 46, which is going to be the one that's the best? The 46, right? <laughs> you understand that? Okay. Yes, please. That's right. That's right. And when you have to drive from Provo to get into your airline, it'll take you to uh, Butte, Montana, because that airline doesn't do it. You need to understand that. Okay. Now, I suggest that there's one other consideration that you'll want to look into, and that is the quality of life for you. Now, this is the bottom line. I criticized you earlier about profitability. And I didn't mean to say that your own personal likes and dislikes and intuitions and all of those kind of emotional things inside were wrong. I'm just leaving that to last. Just leaving that to last. When we get to, when we're considering, say, 12 different locations, just theoretically, and you get three that are within 10 or 15 or 20 points of each other, There gets to be some personal things involved in that. And, I'll, and those personal things aren't the same for me as they are for you. So you need to put that down as your kind of uh, quality of life is what I call it. That should be the deciding factor when anything is close. But if you're deciding between a 46 and 182, quality of life doesn't count. It's only when things get down really close because you're going to have to be sacrificing a lot. Is there any more questions at that point? Yes, please. I don't know how to answer that except from my own experience, okay? My personal experience is, is that in the retail business, I love competition. I think that the greatest thing in the world that could happen to the ZCMI Center is to have the crossroads go across the street. Now, if your Cardal uh, objects de art in the ZCMI Center and there's three other gift shops going in across the street, that may not hold true. What I am saying to you is, is that whenever a major store goes in competition with another major store, the consumer benefits. The consumer benefits because the stores then go hammer at tongs in each other. You get better pricing, 
you get better merchandising, you get better research of the market, they start, what's that? More, important, more, customers. more customers, that's right. I was going to get to that in just a second. The downtown Salt Lake City, we drive, and I'm sure this is no surprise to you, we drive a lot of people away at Christmas because in order to get anywhere downtown, you have to wait 45 minutes to make a right turn, park, or do anything, and we really have a problem. Okay, what we're doing downtown, we've been reaching out to all the businesses, trying to form together and work with them and do all the magic things. But some of the little folks keep having the bad habit of going out of business. So we're trying to hold on. Well, now when the crossroads opens up across the street, we then have 185 stores between the two of us with about 6,000 parking places between the two of us that instead of becoming Utah's place to shop, we then can compete with San Francisco on the left and Denver on the right. And we very uh, definitely will be in that position. We will be a major shopping center for the Inner Mountain West from San Francisco through to Denver. So I very definitely, make a long question longer, think that competition is good. Yes. Obviously, if three of them, A, B, and C, let's say, were 80, 90, and 100 total points, D, E, and F were 200, 210, and 220, okay, you would pick the top three. But what if they are within a... Go ahead, I'm listening. ...a several point difference total? And is, is there a specific cutoff that you should use or... How do you exactly determine then which ones to use and which ones not to use? I don't think I can answer that question because of several things. First of all, you may have picked out 12 really rotten locations. Right. <laughs> and they may all be really close to each other, the top three, but they stink. You see what I'm saying? Okay. So you may have to be just really aware of that. You know, if they come out to be... Uh, well, if they come out to be in the 150s and that kind of a thing, and I'm just using that as a theoretical situation, uh, that doesn't mean that that's your best thing. That only means of those things, see, in the very first place, you've had to go out and look yourself. Well, I haven't given you any indication except the very first 12 things that I told you what to go out and look for. But, you know, your sweetheart uh, or your wife or either one may think that <laughs> we have to stay in Kearns. You know, it's got to be Taylorsville because I ain't moving. <coughs> well, you go look around there, you know, you're, you haven't got the world's greatest business. Uh, you're, you're selling tropical goldfish, right? <laughs> now, there may not be an awful lot of aquariums in Kearns. So you may not do really well, but of all the 12 locations that you look at in Kearns, there's going to be three best ones. So what I'm saying on the other thing is, on the other hand, you may be really good. You may be really sharp. I've been in business with a partner that left you with all the money, and you've got another suck, uh, partner. So you're going to go into business with him, right? And both of you may be pretty sharp, so you've picked out 12 really good locations. So I don't know how to answer that question. Then there is no minimum number of that. I, I, I can't say that, no, no or yes. No, I'm, because you gave us eight different topics, and then you gave us okay. five from poor, fair, good, very good to excellent. Okay, right. That comes up to 40. Eight times five is 40. Right. right. And then the modification factor of that, uh, the weight of each topic. All right. So right. somehow you should be able to come up with a minimum cutoff point, shouldn't you? I, I'm, well, I guess really what I'm saying, down into a nutshell, that is really such a subjective thing that I couldn't pretend to stand up here and say it's 126. Well, I, I didn't know whether you had a, a specific engineering form which said... No, I don't. Okay. Is there anybody in here that does? Okay, the other lectures haven't got here yet. They're all smarter than I am, so I, they may have. Go ahead. Ab absolutely, because you still you still prorate them the, the very same way. And the guy that's going into to be an auto mechanic, 
for Cadillacs will not do well in Riverton. You know what I'm saying? There's just not a lot of cars around. Well, he may because Owen Wright's down there, but what I'm, you, you follow what I'm saying, don't you? If you're going to be an auto mechanic and deal in Volkswagens, that's a lot different than being a Cadillac, even though the same, it's the same industry. And both of those are much different than being in air conditioning, and those are much different than being in retail sales where you sell shoes. So all of the requirements, and that's another reason here where I can't give you a, you know, you've just got to play Chinese checkers with that whole program, but what I have given you will suffice for every one of you, as you just said, that uh, in anything that you're doing. But you have to be smart enough to know what counts. That's right. That's right. That's right. And there may be one or two of you in here that are smarter than all the rest and can do that better. Now, from the looks of you, I doubt it. <laughs> Go ahead. Did you have a question? Or are you just falling asleep? That's exactly right. Manufacturing goes, right now, I think it's oh, right around $4 a foot, but good retail space goes for about 18 What makes that difference? Right. A shoe manufacturing would not do well at the Crossroads Center. I mean, you know, it just wouldn't do well. It would probably do very well out in Kearns, where all the manufacturing is up around, you know, the Hercules and so on up in there, because that's what it's geared for. <coughs> Anything else? Yes. Yes, it's called bureaucracy and red tape. I don't want to break your heart, but you haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> wait till you find an agent. Wait till you find two agencies that have regulations that are competing with each other, and in order to satisfy one, you have to go against the other one. Go ahead. <laughs> Right. I understand at some point, isn't there a, a lawyer or a, 
a gentleman's going to be covering that in the yeah. yes this afternoon. He's he's a lot smarter than I am, so he can probably cover that with you. Now I understand your plight. Uh, that's one of the tragic parts of American life. Okay. I appreciate your endurance, and uh, would you like to take up and take a stretch here? We've got 20 more minutes to go. If there's locations that compare, uh, I don't see anything wrong with that. If you if you own the same, if you have a, a business location and one's doing well for you, it's just a, you wouldn't want to pick up your business and start all over again somewhere else. Okay. Go ahead. How would I be able to use? You indicated demographic was like having to use This I could not see how this would. Be in my business. Right? Because you get all lots of lights, which doesn't. Same thing with geographic. All incomes, all agents, where's your product? All incomes. I service air conditioning, heating, and refrigeration. I service air conditioning units, service and install maintenance on furnaces, heating plants, and the same thing with refrigeration. So, this as such, I, I, I don't see how that could be. Well, all I'm trying to say to you is that. You don't have to consider all those. Just you, you need to key in on ones and find out which are the most important to you. Benefits definitely that. Right. That would be. Well, that, that's what you need to put in the consumer and the uh, customer uh, characteristics that I talked to you about. That's that's the one you'd use instead of that one. Instead of that one. Same thing with geographic, just like that. What about psychographic? Uh, uh, I. Well, you wouldn't do an awful lot of business on the, on the Central City area, so you need to determine you need to determine that. And don't do an awful lot of advertising in the downtown the Central Business yeah. District. See what I'm saying? Appreciate that. You, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, shall we go ahead? Uh, that was just my way of being courteous to those that really wanted to leave and didn't want to walk out in the middle of the lecture. So, the uh, next thing that we need to consider is the advertising budget. Now, this is a, uh, an interesting approach. You might want to write this down. I firmly believe that the less that you can afford an advertising campaign, the more you need one. So if you can't afford to advertise, you probably should. I don't know if that makes sense to you or not and how to get around it. Without advertising, people won't know you're there. Oscar Wilde had a quote that I'm taking out of context, he says that the only thing worse than people talking about you is people not talking about you. And that's very true in advertising. If people are not talking about your business, you're in trouble. Now that ties in with their advertising. I'm sure that you'll be able to make a go of it in most businesses, most small businesses, by word of mouth and publicity, especially if you're situated in, in uh, downtown ZCMI Center. Because traffic will just bring will just bring you a certain amount of, of people. 
But I suggest that sooner or later, you're going to recognize that you can't drift, that you're going to have to grow and attract new clients continually. You must advertise for several reasons. We won't go into those. Let's see, we've got, I'm just trying to figure which of this to cover here. All right. Okay. I'll cut out the next five minutes and get right on to that specific subject. There's a word nowadays called positioning or advertising strategy. How did, how did uh, 7 Up become popular most recently? It's the what? Uncola. What is that called? That's called positioning. They're not a soft drink. They are the Uncola. If you don't want like cola, folks, you drink 7-Up. I mean, that's the, that's the position they've created, okay? That's what I'm talking about. The very first step, and this is very important no matter what size of business that you're in, write this one down. The first, determine just who you are. Who are you? You're one of 452 air conditioning people in Salt Lake City, but for Clarence Pollard, he's the guy, I'll be there if you need me. Okay? Made a lot of money on that. Beg your pardon? That's right. That's right. Catering to the, to the uh, Mormon lifestyle. Do you see what I'm trying to say to you? They have positioned themselves in some part of the market. In what price range are your products? Is your emphasis on price? Is your emphasis on quality? Is your emphasis on service? What exactly are you selling? What exactly are you selling? The man that tries to sell a pair of shoes will go out of business. If he sells what to do with those shoes, I'm sure this is another way of saying sell the sizzle and not the steak, okay? If you know what it is you're selling, the benefits of what you're selling, it will work best for you. What extras do you want to tell the public about? Who are you? Do you have credit plans? Uh, do you have restrooms? You know, in that whole spectrum, there's things to talk about. Once that you're sure who you are, and this ties in with what I was talking about before and, and what we just talked about with this gentleman down here, it is absolutely mandatory that you decide who they are. When you define who you are, you've got to know who your customer is. What exact, precise, specific consumer group are you going after? And then when you've decided your potential market, focus your attention on them. Be able to see them. Now, this is a little game that we can get our intuition and our feelings and emotions worked up about. Be able to relate, folks, to who your customer is. And this is not said in any criticism at all. I'm just as serious as I can be. If you are a long hair trying to sell to a businessman, folks, it ain't going to work. If you are business people, short missionary haircut, nice blue business suits, trying to sell uh, go-aheads and waterbeds, it may not work. You understand what I'm saying? I'm suggesting to you, define your potential market, focus your attention on him, and then make sure you can serve that person. That gets us into our advertising. You've got to be able to put your message across. Several things that you need to find in your message. As we've talked about our psychographics, let's just deal with that in our positioning. Number one, it should be clear and written in the customer's terminology. Not yours, the customer's terminology in the vocabulary. Do you know what that is? Higher income people have a different kind of vocabulary than a low income person. You can get their attention better. A lower income person has a vocabulary of big prices about like that, says 50% off. Okay? Higher income people talk about 
the quality. Now, that's not true all the time, but do you understand what I'm trying to get across to you? Next one is, after interest, provoking interest, it should appeal to the people's wants and needs, not yours. Get your ego out of it. What they want and what they need. How the products, uh, the features of the product are going to satisfy that. What are the desirable features of the product that are going to satisfy those wants and needs? And make it sound believable. I am so sick of hearing... Now, I hope he's not here. He's going to be a tenant in our mall. Of hearing Mr. Max sale come in because, you know, we just got another huge shipment and it's another big sale. You know, it's the day after St. Patrick's Day sale and the two days after St. Patrick's Day sale and four days before St. Everything is a big deal. To me, that's just not believable. I don't know how it sits with the rest of you because he does a phenomenal business. But you've got to be believable. The next one is your advertising should motivate people to buy. This sounds like a contradiction that I've just given you, but why should you buy today? Why should you buy this week? Why is it important to buy now? What is Chrysler coming out and telling you? What if they, if they found out who they are now? Who is Chrysler Corporation? What does the Mr. Lee, uh, what is his name? Still can't say it, and you told me, and I heard what you said. Yeah, what is it that he says? The new Chrysler Corporation. And folks, if you ever wanted something new in cars, now is the time to try it. Now, because we've got a 90-day, what? Money-back guarantee. Money guarantee. That's the reason to buy now. Now, if you can find some of those in your businesses, you need to advertise it. And then make sure that you tell your folks where to buy. I don't know what what part of this to try to talk to you about. I'm, I'm just going to hard charge for a few minutes, okay? In your advertising, always buying bigger advertising or more advertising is not the answer. If you're dwindling in sales, just doubling your newspaper size ad or doubling your schedule on the radio is not going to answer what the problem is. You need to find out what the problem is. If you're, if you're uh, down in sales, increased advertising will not handle poor merchandising, is what I'm saying. Number two, don't overwrite. Be very simple and clear and understandable. <coughs> Three, feature the right merchandise in your advertising. What are those shoes called that, uh, they're, they're uh, the Dutch shoes, clogs. Those were popular for a, a couple of years. This last season, people have bought every store in, in the center has got clogs, and guess how well they're selling? Some of the stores, have, some of the shoe stores have bought Western boots for the women. Boots are really in now, right? Bought Western boots. Western boots. Boots, yes. Western, no. So see what I'm saying? You need to know what it is that people want. If you have, and this is typical, and I, you know, I could spend, as I say, three more hours telling you this. If you have selected something that you want to get rid of, don't even bother advertising it because that's the wrong motivation. If it didn't sell the first six times that you had it on sale, it's not going to sell the seventh. Do you understand that? Unless you tell people very loudly and clearly, Folks, I've really made a bad decision in my marketing. I do that several times. In order to get rid of it, come in and make me a deal because I need, I need some cash flow. And that, that's a legitimate kind of ad. But you need to label it as a lemon because when folks then come in and they find out that you only have uh, a size number 16 in bright red pumps, you know, and they've been expecting something else, they'll, they'll never come back. A photo or an illustration is much more compelling than straight text. If you can show it in a picture, do it instead of writing about it. Your store name, address, and telephone number should be very significant part of your ad, unless you're Jack, uh, J. Magnans or one of the really elite that specialize in not 
telling people who they are or where they can come. Have you ever seen a J. Magnin's ad? Does not tell anybody where they're located. And very small J. Magnin. That's the, that's the trend nationally. But for a small businessman, make it a very significant part of your ad. Now, a series of advertisements will have more powerful effect than one shot. Okay, do not buy a full-page newspaper ad to tell your message. Make it on a logical, consistent basis. The same thing with radio. Impact is by consistency, not by size, most of the time. And second, uh, the last thing that I'd like to suggest to you, and I, you could cover all these principles, but we don't have time to do it. Exercise care in your media selection. Uh, I'll just give you, for example, when I advertise, and I'm sure this is contrary to a lot of, of good folks that advertise a different kind of a product. When I advertise for the ZCMI Center downtown, I have proved undeniably that if we advertise in the newspaper first and in radio last, it will never work. I've done it, done it, done it. What works is if you go on broadcast first and then newspaper. You see why? Broadcast, people are driving down the street thinking about the kids in the back seat that if they yell in their ear one more time, they see what? Radio is an intrusive media. Radio has to push its way in. Beautiful music. You're having dinner. You're not interested in that, that commercial. You're having, you know, relaxing at the end of the day and so on. Radio sets the tone. It softens your mind, if you will. It softens your, you hear it 16 times in the week. And then on Friday before the sale, Mama sees it, that now's the day that we've been telling you about for a week. And if you don't come today, it's all over. So she go down and we take market studies and 90% of the people, where did you see the ad? Oh, in the Deseret News. Well, then we ask, what's your favorite radio stations? And it's a direct related to the radio stations that we've bought. Now, why is that? Well, because people's minds and, and attention have been got by the radio, and then the newspaper makes the decision. So you need to decide for your business. We've got four minutes left. What can I... Very effective if you do it in the right, proper way. If you, uh, if you have a series of apartments in your area or if you have some very tight uh, residential areas in your area based on the product, to just let people know that you're there, it's not very effective. Not very effective if, if at all. You've got to have some big, powerful punch to let people know that you're there. A ho-hum, another restaurant. Could you compare direct mail Depends on your product, once again. That's why I can't get into discussion all that. Uh, I'm sure your SBA people would be glad to meet with you on that based on the product that you're going to. Uh, direct mail uh, Direct mail tends to get very expensive if you're doing it on a large program. Uh, direct mail works very well for higher priced uh, situations on a catalog to higher income people. Uh, or if you have some real gimmick on it, uh, you know, I'm sure you've seen the advertising where they list uh, one of these people has won a $4,000 trip to South Panguitch. <laughs> and you see, you see five names listed, and there your is, number three. You rip it open because you think, you know, somehow they've checked into that. And you have to be able to know what that kind is. But that very seldom works for small business, unless you know how to use it really well. And go ahead. I think it's something on your advertising on a calendar would be a lot more effective than just flyers as such because people would take a flyer and throw it away on a calendar. They'd hang up on the wall and advertise it. Well, once again, that's a, that's a matter of debate. That, that has been kicked around for so many times. I'm not too much in favor of that kind of advertising unless you have a very sophisticated kind of a business that you need to advertise institutionally. That's institutional advertising and to have your name on a calendar. Now, why do people go to a calendar? Why do people go to calendars? What? To check their schedule and the date. Oh, no, it's another lecture down at the Utah Technical. They never see the ad. See what I'm saying to you? There's this big, beautiful picture and the date there, and you see the picture and the date and then the little strip ad at the bottom, right? Joe's Insurance and Beer Parlor. <laughs> When's the last time you ever made a decision to go to somewhere based on a calendar ad? I'm just saying, I'm not criticizing that. I'm only saying you really have to know what you're doing with that kind of advertising. The thing that I'm suggesting for you that 
Radio, television, and newspaper for small business people and flyers are typically the best way to go. You do not have enough money to cover all the possible ways that you could advertise. You're going to have to zero in, see what your budget is, program it out, and that's another whole lecture of how to go about doing that. Yes? Yes. Yes. Uh, You're a calendar salesman, right? <laughs> no, I was going to ask you, what do you think of this electronic uh, advertising you see? You know, like, they got this electronic words that shoot out two or three words at a time, like buy water beds or maybe bank hair or, you know, they put out the same. Yes, I'll tell, you, uh, I'll tell you that those particular things are doing very poorly as income generators. People get right on them and then get right off them. Well, apparently they don't work. I, I guess in a nutshell, what I'm saying to you folks, why not just go with the old proven standbys? What about yellow pages? What's the ratio of success in yellow pages? Yellow pages for, for an air conditioner, somebody that's around, you know, that kind of a thing. When a person's in an emergency and is looking for it, but for a shoe store, just unless people are looking for it for the location, what are you going to tell them? What are you going to tell them? It, it's not timely. You know, if it's just not timely. Uh, you can't tell them a whole lot other than your name and your location. You can't tell them what you've got in store, what's on sale today, uh, any of those kind of things. And so other than just a, an Im if people are going to be checking for a telephone number or a location, it's really good. Yes? Absolutely depends on all of that. You know that that could be a, a five thousand dollar consulting fee to answer those two questions right there. Uh, let me just give you a real fast break, okay? Thursday, Friday, and Saturday for retail services. Monday and Tuesday for for uh, services, air conditioning and uh, plumbing and so forth. Monday and Tuesday are really good. Be why? Okay, and because nobody else advertises, you're not competing with everybody in town that says, come on down to the grocery store because we've got 186,000 no-names. Okay? You're not competing. So Monday and Tuesday is the very best day. As many people read the newspaper those days, but you're not competing. So the retail services all go for the end of the week because Friday and Saturday is the heaviest retail days, and every retailer wants his place filled Friday and Saturday because if they're not, they're in bad shape. There's, we're past our time. I can answer two more questions. Is that all right, sir? Yes, go ahead. Um, you're familiar with general nutrition up there in the mall. Yes. Okay. Uh, and I was a manager of that once. I remember. Uh, they have a little car, a man in this car, and they have a little car. How do you feel that is as an advertising? Tell me that again. I didn't hear what you said. I think that's very terrific for general nutrition because you have, you have identified, exactly identified your customer. Psychographics, you know, if you, can, if you can figure out a system to narrow your customers down and then re advertise to them, that's the, most, that's the best kind of advertising there is because basically you're going by word of mouth advertising. I mean, you're saying to the folks that want you, here I am. Now. Let me just say that all these things that I'm throwing out, folks, if I, if I really knew what I was doing, I'd be a millionaire. So everything that I'm telling you is open to so much debate that it's unbelievable. But I generally have tried to give you some true principles. Uh, <clears throat> what I'm saying is don't write them in the back of your uh, standard works or anything. You know, they're just not all eternal truths. You need to, you need to define for yourself and work out your own, your own uh, things. Now, I've left off the last three hours of the lecture, but I, I'm sure you're appreciative of that, and uh, I appreciate being with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we want to take a break right now. Uh, there are refreshments uh, set up in the lobby. There's computer display uh, out there, and there's a lot of applications of these little computers your particular businesses. So I hope you'll spend some time asking some questions of 
how will this apply to my business? How can I get it to work for me? And how, how will it save me money? How will it make things more accurate? How, how can it generate income for me? <clears throat> Ask those kind of questions to them out there. Uh, we'll take about a 15-minute break, then we have Mr. John Adams, an attorney, who will be talking about some legal considerations you'd be interested in. As you can see, there's some uh, some really good applications of those little mini computers to uh, many of your small businesses, uh, and it's fascinating, uh, as witnessed by several empty chairs there. So we'll have people joining us uh, shortly, I'm sure. Our next speaker is an attorney, uh, Mr. John Adams. He is going to be speaking about some legal considerations you need to be concerned with as a small business person, uh, forms of business organization, and he's uh, very good at fielding questions that you may have with uh, uh, various problems you have had or anticipate in the business setting. Uh, Mr. Adams has been practicing law for some time now, and he was to our workshop last year and one of our uh, most favorite speakers. So. Uh, without any further introduction, Mr. Adams, if you'd like to take over. I'm not sure what the uh, what the standard operating procedure has been uh, with the group in terms of questions, but I'd like to kind of try and leave it open. They've given us uh, on the schedule an hour, and we're shy a few minutes, but I'd like to leave it sort of open as I go through if you have any questions about anything I uh, indicate, or if you have any other questions, just feel free to raise your hand and uh, we'll maybe try and feel them as we go and they might mean a little bit more at that point. 
I uh, sort of enjoy, I've done this a couple of times with the SBA, and the SBA has helped me a couple of times in a class that I teach up at the university, and uh, it's always kind of fun to meet with uh, people who are interested in small business and see a lot of folks here who, a few familiar faces and a, and a lot of others, I'm sure, who are either in business or considering it. <clears throat> Sam Siciliano at the SBA tells a, a kind of an interesting story about a fellow who succeeds in spite of himself, and I'm not going to go into the story here because it takes a little longer than I have, but it always reminds me, and especially when I look over the agenda here and the other uh, speakers that are here and the questions that are and, uh, and items that are addressed of, of hoping that we can in some small way help some of you avoid uh, problems and maybe avoid some of the problems that we ourselves got into. When I uh, graduated from law school, I started my own firm with, uh, at that point in time, one other partner. And uh, when I hear Norm Morris talking about uh, advertising and picking your location and so on, we were in, in a little different breed maybe than some who graduate from law school now because we couldn't advertise at that point. Lawyers now are given that privilege uh, if that's what it is. And uh, we couldn't advertise, so my initial partner and I uh, picked a location. We started practicing in Aeropress Square. Some of you may know where that is. Not in the best location. We were sort of in a building in the back and, and uh, had our name on a, on a directory that you practically had to go through uh, uh, the entire division before you would ever see our name or directory. So we spent some time waiting for our very first client, as some of you may spend some time waiting for your very first customer, uh, except that you can advertise where we couldn't. But we uh, we took turns as we were there. We weren't very uh, we weren't very wealthy and had just gotten out of law school, didn't have anything uh, to speak of and no clients. And so we just start out with found an area. We were lucky in terms of a location because we found an area which had been refurbished by a stock brokerage firm. They were just getting ready to open, and if any of you have ever been in a stock brokerage, you know they have a phone about every five feet and a desk about every five feet for all their brokers, and they had just uh, refurbished uh, this center, new carpet, new drapes, uh, furniture, as I say, they had all these phones installed, and the day, literally, that they were to open, the Securities and Exchange Commission shut them down. So uh, we were able to walk into a nice place uh, that had just been redone. We didn't know what to do with all the phones, but, but uh, we initially took a waiting room and one office. And since we didn't have any clients and didn't have any money, why, we took turns. One of us would be the attorney for an hour, and the other one would be the receptionist, and then we'd switch. And uh, I recall our, our very, very first client, uh, and I knew, uh, I knew my... My partner's footsteps, we had brick coming into the office, and I'd uh, had a lot of time to, to uh, recognize my partner's footsteps, and I could hear some footsteps coming up the brick, and I got all nervous, and it was really my turn to be the receptionist, but Kent had stepped down the hall, so I was there alone, and so uh, I ran around and went into the office and sat there. Our phone, you know, they had these phones there. They weren't hooked up or anything, but, we, but I sat there and, and waited until this, until this fellow came in, and I just left my door ajar about so much and, and waited until I could just see his shadow just kind of in my door so I knew he could hear me. And I reached back and picked up one of these phones that didn't work, put it up to my ear and waited until he was close enough. And as soon as I could see that he was within earshot, why, I said, well, you know, we're awfully busy and I don't know whether we have time to take your case or not. And if you can't give us at least a $500 retainer, I'm sure we couldn't talk to you. But if you feel like you want to do that, why, come on in and we'll make an appointment. And I turned around and hung it up as if to be surprised and said, oh, can I help you? And he said, yes, I'm the telephone man here to hook up your phones. <laughs> so my, my partner has never let me forget that, and he never will. And I hope maybe some of you with a little advertising and, uh, and a little bit of planning can avoid that sort of a thing. I, I'm always reminded of that when I get involved here. So... Maybe I can help in some small way. Uh, what I've been asked to talk about today are legal considerations in uh, different forms of business, and I think that's a, a very, very important uh, decision that each and every one of you ought to make, Be and it's a decision a lot of people don't think about until it's too late. There are really four or five major uh, types of business organization. Uh, and I'll go through each one of them, at least in some fashion, to give you an idea of what they are and what they're about and what some of the advantages and disadvantages are. 
But that legal organization is literally the very foundation of your business. And everything you do is built upon that, the way you sign your leases, the way you pay your taxes, the way you, uh, you do anything, make any contracts and so on, are all a function of what kind of a legal organization you are. And many of the comments that, uh, that have been made and will be made by some of the other speakers, I'm sure will go to that question. Specifically, your CPA, I'm sure when he talks about taxes and record keeping and regulations, will explain to you that there are some substantial differences in those kinds of items depending upon the particular legal organization that you choose. The major ones about which I'm going to talk, and there are some, some hybrids here and there, but I don't think they're important enough, especially in the time we've got to go into too much detail about, but the major ones are, first of all, a sole proprietorship. Second of all, a partnership, and I'll just refer to that as a general partnership. Third, a limited partnership. And fourth, a corporation. Now, those are the major ones. There's one other one that I'll mention, and that's called a subchapter S corporation that some of you may have heard about, and we'll talk a little bit about that. You may have heard of what's called a joint venture, and that's a possibility. Uh, let me just talk about each one of them a little bit to give you an idea of some of the background and, and what they mean. A sole proprietorship means just that. It's, it's one individual, one owner. Uh, and for all intents and purposes, in terms of comments, uh, that is just the same as any one of you who own a business and you run the business just as an individual, you pay your taxes just like an individual, and so on and so forth. A general partnership, on the other hand, is an association between two or more people. There's an unlimited number that you could have in a partnership. Some of your large CPA firms, for instance, and even some law firms, but not so much, uh, you'll have a lot of national CPA firms and worldwide CPA firms that are still partnerships. They may literally have thousands of partners, uh, and they never incorporate. That's formed through a contractual agreement between the partners. Uh, I'm often asked the question, does it have to be written? And the answer is no, it doesn't have to be written but I think you are not very smart if you don't make that a written agreement. There's a lot of reasons for that. One of the major reasons, and I usually get into these problems too late, uh, are that the partners don't have a written agreement and they both don't really understand specifically what their agreement is. And they don't realize that until it is time to take home the money uh, or until it's time to find out they don't have any money to take home and they have to pay the bills and uh, so on. And then they begin to all of a sudden realize that they didn't define very well what they each understood to be the agreement and how the money is to be divided and so on and so forth. So although it doesn't have to be written, it ought to be written. In a partnership, all of the partners have an equal voice unless it is specifically written to the contrary. And that's an important item. In, under Utah law, uh, and that's where I assume most of you do have or will have your businesses, if you have one partner that has more say for any particular reason or that takes home any more money or any less money or, or that takes any more of the tax loss or so on, that has to be written or otherwise it is equal. And we often have partners come in after the fact who are now at odds and one partner sits down and he says, wait a minute, he says, I put in three quarters of the money into this partnership and now he wants to take home half if we got a couple of them there. And the other one says, well, you might have put in more money, but I put in more time, or I put in more expertise, and I always thought that I was the one who was going to get three quarters of the profits, and so on. So it is important to have that written if you, if you want to get into a partnership. Perhaps the biggest question uh, that we're asked about partnerships and some of the biggest problems with a partnership is liability. Uh, each partner in a partnership is personally liable to the full extent of his personal assets for any of the obligations of the partnership. Now, by that I mean, when I say personally liable, if there is an obligation of the partnership and the partnership funds themselves, can't satisfy it, each and every partner is liable in terms of his personal home, his personal bank account, his personal automobiles, and everything else, right down to the bootstraps. Uh, and so that is a rather... Uh, serious consideration to make uh, when you're considering whether or not you want to be a partnership. Now, to clarify that, uh, that is any obligation of the partnership. That doesn't mean if there are two or three of you and one of the guys goes down to ZCMI and charges a couple of rooms of furniture for his new home and doesn't pay for it, that doesn't make the other partners liable on that obligation because it's not a partnership obligation. It isn't even arguably a partnership obligation. 
On the other hand, if that same partner goes down to Ken Garf and buys a 450 SL Mercedes-Benz automobile and indicates that he's buying it in the partnership name for the partnership, uh, and if Ken Garf, under all of the circumstances, considers that to be reasonable, that is, if he's not put on notice uh, that that is unreasonable, it may, in fact, be the case that that would become a, an arguable partnership liability, even if that partner jumps in the car and drives to Mexico and you don't see him again. So each fact, and there's not a, a, a white or a black line, most of them are gray, and each one of these obligations uh, is tested on its own facts. That's not generally a problem. Where we really get into problems in partnerships and obligations oftentimes are where one partner is making a delivery during the day or where one partner is driving to work or driving home from work and he gets in an automobile accident. He hits a, a pedestrian who's coming across the street from the grocery store or something and pretty soon you find out that not only is he sued for that accident but the partnership is sued and that the plaintiff, the person injured, uh, uh, attempts to indicate that he was on partnership business at the time of the accident. And at that point in time, and some of the judgments that juries and others are giving now for personal injuries uh, and other kinds of liability can, can result in a substantial obligation against the business. And if you're one of the partners, you're liable. With respect to that liability, by the way, it is what we call in the law joint and several liability, which means that all of the partners are liable uh, and, the, and any one partner is liable to the full extent of the obligation. Take the instance of this one partner who hits a pedestrian in the crosswalk and the partnership gets sued and they obtain a $250,000 verdict uh, against the partnership. Maybe the guy driving the car doesn't have any money and maybe you as one of the partners has a lot of money. They're entitled to come to you and collect the entire amount. It's then your problem to have to go after your partner to see if he'll pay you back his fair share, or all of it, as the case may be. So liability is a, is a serious consideration. I don't say that to scare you necessarily away from a partnership, because there are a lot of ways that you can hedge your bet against that. One of them is a written partnership agreement, which I'll talk about in a moment. Another one is insurance, which I note uh, one of the other uh, uh, speakers is going to talk about, and so on. So there are some protections, but that is nevertheless always uh, in the back of your mind as a partnership. One way you can protect against some of that liability is a written partnership agreement. And I'd like to suggest to you eight or nine bare essentials for a partnership agreement. If you don't go to an attorney to have it drawn up uh, and you do it yourself, uh, you at least ought to have eight or nine things in it. And I would suggest to you not necessarily because just because I'm an attorney, but because of the tremendous uh, number of considerations that ought to go into a partner partnership agreement over and above these things, I would recommend that you go and spend a few dollars on an attorney at least to get some advice. Uh, an attorney uh, with respect to a partnership agreement in the state of Utah will probably charge you somewhere between $100, $150 and on up depending upon how, how critical the agreement is in terms of the number of considerations and the complexity of the partnership and so on. But cost-wise, you're probably looking at, at that area of $150 or so as an average. Eight or nine things you ought to have in there regardless. One, you ought to have the name of the partnership if it has a name. Uh, secondly, you ought to indicate the kind of business to be conducted in the partnership. One of the reasons for that I recommend that is because if you don't specifically state what kind of business the partnership is in, you have a hard time protecting yourself against some spurious claims uh, if your partner goes out and does this, that, or the other thing uh, of a creditor or another who claims, well, he was in the partnership business. If you have that well-defined in your partnership agreement, it can at least help when push comes to shove in any kind of a collection proceeding or lawsuit or otherwise. Uh, third, you ought to have the names and addresses and the status of the general partners. That is, are they all general partners? Uh, are they all equal partners? Uh, does one have any particular advantage or disadvantage uh, in the partnership? And so on and so forth. Fourth, you ought to indicate the duration of the partnership from a beginning date. And that beginning date is important because, as you're all aware from starting your businesses or if you're, or if you're now going out to start one, there's a lot of things that you have to do before your business gets off the ground. And it ought to be in your partnership agreement when the partnership specifically started, so that anything before that time uh, can be indicated as something that was not a part of the partnership in case of any of these questions or obligations. Fifth, and this is a very, very important one, you ought to put in the amount of investment by each partner. 
I'm, I'm truly amazed at how many partnerships, when they get into a disagreement, where the partners come in and literally do not agree, cannot agree on what each partner put into the business. One guy says, I put in $2,000, and the other one says, you did not, you put in $1,000. Uh, or, you know, and that goes on and on and on. You'd think people would remember that, but they don't. And you ought to have it specifically in there. The other problem that happens is where you put in something other than greenbacks. If somebody puts in equipment or if somebody puts in a customer list or if somebody puts in furniture or whatever the situation is, uh, there never is a meeting, or no, I won't say never, but there often is not a true meeting of the minds as to what that's worth. And so then when push comes to shove, the partner says, I put in $1,000 worth of equipment, and the other one says, no, it was only worth 150 and besides that, it didn't work, and so on and so forth. So you have that in your agreement, what each put in, how it's valued, and a written agreement that everybody knows what everybody put in up front. Uh, the sixth thing you ought to have is each partner's duties under the partnership specifically, or as specific as you can be. Is one partner a managing partner and the other one is, is a, a public relations partner who doesn't really manage the business day to day but goes out and brings in business? Or is one person a managing partner and the other one puts in the money into the partnership and so on and so forth? Define what each partner is to do, including the fact if, if both partners are to be full-time employees and, and uh, put their full time into the business, you ought to indicate that. The next item is also very important, and that is the compensation of each partner and any additional provisions for receiving any special consideration. Is it even, or does one partner get 60 percent and 140 or so on and so forth? Uh, very, very important. Eighth, you ought to indicate uh, any special considerations as to loans to the partnership or, or uh, any other kinds of special considerations that one partner should receive or may receive from the partnership. And lastly, you ought to indicate any matters pertaining to the admission of new partners. Uh, you'd be surprised how many times two or three people get together and start a partnership and then realize at some point they have to bring a new partner in. And they, and they really don't know how to do it. How do they decide what their partnership is worth? Do all partners have to agree? Uh, and so on and so forth. You ought to indicate that in your partnership agreement, and an attorney can help you do that in terms of giving you a number of different possibilities and alternatives and help you work out a provision that makes sense to everybody. Of even perhaps more importance is to indicate in the partnership agreement at the beginning of the partnership what happens on the withdrawal or the death of a partner. That's a, a very tough one. We handled a case about two weeks ago uh, where a partnership was making uh, almost three million dollars a year and there were th four, I guess there were three or four partners involved. Two of the partners were together in an airplane and crashed and, and were killed. And they had no partnership agreement. And then the wives and families of the two that were, that were killed in the airplane crash came in and said, all right, we want our share right now. And when you've got a business that is producing two or three million dollars of net income, uh, to four partners every year, and all of a sudden two of the families come in and say, you know, break up the partnership, I want my share right now. That's pretty tough, and, uh, and that's been a real tough problem. And in most partnership agreements, what you would do is up front indicate uh, if any partner dies or, or is insane or withdraws, whatever the situation is, his partnership interest will, A, be purchased by the other partners and you set out how you value it and how long the other partners have to buy it and so on and so forth, or B, we'll dissolve the partnership and do this, that, and the other thing and so on so that it's very orderly, it doesn't have to be a lawsuit, and most importantly, there doesn't have to be a breakup of the partnership uh, because of wives or family or relatives or whoever who are now the heirs and uh, they're not interested in continuing. Some of you don't think that'll be a very big problem. You don't think you'll ever be that big or ever have that problem, but I can tell you it happens in an awful lot of partnerships. And it doesn't necessarily just happen because they're making a lot of money. You might have a lot of assets. You might have a lot of goodwill. You might have a lot of things in that partnership that you'd hate to see go down the drain simply because one partner wants to get out. Uh, and by the way, I didn't mention that, but in a partnership, uh, if any partner decides to withdraw, or dies, or goes insane, or becomes incompetent, or files bankruptcy, or for any other reason that makes him really incompetent as a partner, the partnership is over under the law. It ends unless you have some provisions uh, otherwise in writing that indicates that the partnership can continue and what happens to his interest. And that's rather serious, so keep that in mind. And then you ought to also have in your partnership agreement 
uh, some kind of provisions for the ultimate dissolution of the partnership if it's only for a limited time. Some of these partnerships you don't indicate will go on forever. It, you might say it goes on for five years or 10 years or 15 years and so on. Uh, and if you have a limited, uh, not a limited partnership, but if you have a limited time for which your partnership is in existence, you ought to indicate what will happen at the end of the partnership. Now, <clears throat> I talked about a limited partnership and that is simply a partnership by two or more people where you have at least one general partner. And when I say general partner, I mean you have at least one partner who is totally liable uh, for the debts and obligations of the partnership. And then you can have one or more, an unlimited amount of limited partnerships, or excuse me, limited partners. The difference between a, a general partnership and a limited partner uh, is that a limited partner is not unlimitedly liable. He doesn't have that exposure of anything that happens uh, uh, with respect to the business of the partnership. The purpose is to provide the business organization with all the advantages of a partnership, but with some partners uh, who don't have any obligations beyond whatever assets the business itself has. And what a limited partner does, in effect, is like a stockholder in a corporation. He'll take his $100 or $1,000 or whatever it is that he invests for his limited partnership interest, he puts it into the business, and that is at risk. That $100 or that $1,000 is at risk if the business goes under or has some debts or so on, but then the buck stops. He's got a Gardal shield around him. Uh, if there's any kind of a question about debts of the partnership or if we have this accident I talked about, he is not on the line. Uh, he is protected. Now, he gives up something for that, and what a limited partner gives up is that he is not entitled to any right to manage the partnership. He doesn't have a vote with respect to what happens. He doesn't have any kind of an interest in the management. And in fact, if he becomes active in the management of the business, he loses his partnership status. So that's the, uh, that's the difference right there with a limited partner. And a lot of people have come in and said, well, gee, I ought, to just, you know, I ought to just have a limited partnership and I'll let somebody else uh, be the general partner and, and they'll have all the liability. And that's fine, but recognize if you are a limited partner, you don't get to, to manage the business or have anything to have any say about what happens. Yes? Mm-hmm. To your son, you mean? Uh, the answer ordinarily would be yes if he is just an employee. Uh, if he's a limited partner and he's making the basic management decisions along with you, he may in fact be giving up his limited partnership status in terms of protection from liability. Now, he might not give it up for all purposes, but if in fact you are sued by a creditor or you are sued by, uh, and I don't mean to put everything in a lawsuit vein, but any kind of a problem where, where there's any personal liability, and that's usually where it comes, uh, is they will go to him uh, and they will indicate, look, you're the one who is partly responsible for making the decisions which led to the debt and so on and so forth, and he at that point may be considered a general partner. And that's the reason, by the way, that limited partners are given that protection is that they ought not to be blamed or ought not to be liable for any of the partnership decisions. They didn't have anything to do with them. And where in a general partnership, everybody has an equal voice, so everybody is equally liable for whatever happens. Uh, so that's a question, and, and that's a question where if he, is, if he is under the partnership agreement, and by the way, a limited partnership agreement does have to be in writing in order to be a proper limited partnership agreement, and it has to be filed with the county in which you do your major portion of business. That, I, I shouldn't say that, where you have your main office, whether that's where you do most of your business or not. It has to be filed with the county clerk in that county. They don't have a, a veto on your agreement. Whatever it says, uh, as long as it complies with the law, it can say, that's up to you. But it does have to be filed. And the reason it does, by the way, is really for information purposes, so that people can go to the county and find out whether a business is a limited partnership, and if so, who the limited partners and who the general partners are. Uh, but each one of those cases where a limited partner gets involved to any extent is a case where you just have to look at each one on its facts and it depends 
you know, how involved they are and what the decisions were and so on. If they were just an employee, if they are just a delivery boy, for instance, your son could certainly be a limited partner and have the protection and still be a delivery boy where you tell him, you know, to go deliver and do this and do that. But where he is involved in making some of the basic management and business decisions, he does run the risk of losing that limited partnership protection status. That's correct. There is, no, there is no absolute rule other than that the statutes in this state indicate that if a limited partner becomes actively engaged in the management of the business, that he then, and I don't know whether it says, I think it says shall, but it may say may, lose his status as a limited partner. Now, that may or may not ever come up, obviously. If you get into a problem where it's important, uh, it may come up, and otherwise it may not. IRS, for instance, is not too concerned uh, oftentimes with what you're talking about, uh, a limited partner would still be able to take whatever share he was to take and get the protections and the advantages and so on for tax purposes uh, in that case. But really where you run the risk is with respect to other obligations of the business of any kind. No, no, that wouldn't be a manage, you know, really a, a management decision basic to the corporation. But if he, on the other hand, decides uh, what creditors you deal with and how much to buy and whether you open a new store and you know so on and so forth, the basic management decisions, hiring and firing and so on, he might find himself liable. The next major form of business that we discussed was a corporation. And that is an animal which is important to understand. It's an artificial being, really, which exists only in the contemplation of the law. That is, a corporation is really created by the state. And I don't mean by the federal government, but actually by each of the 50 states. They each have their own laws with respect to incorporation. And it is... It is, as such, really created just like a person, and, and that's really what the law gives to it, is all of the rights uh, and remedies that any other citizen of a state has. And, in fact, it has been held in the courts that a corporation has all of the same rights and privileges under the Bill of Rights and the Constitution of the United States as a person has, with a couple of very important exceptions. One is a corporation does not have the right against self-incrimination, you know, the right to take the Fifth Amendment. Uh, the case where that was actually decided, which may be interesting, is, uh, is a number of years ago where Westinghouse and General Electric and some of the other big electrical companies were fixing the price of light bulbs and, and, uh, and those kinds of supplies, and they were uh, charged with a violation, both criminally and civilly, of the laws of the United States and antitrust laws. The president of Westinghouse attempted to get on the stand, and when they asked him whether or not he was involved in, uh, in, or whether or not the company was involved in fixing prices, he said, I take the Fifth Amendment. Uh, and it was decided in a quick hurry that a corporation cannot take the Fifth Amendment uh, on the witness stand. They have to answer all the questions, regardless of whether it incriminates them or not. And that's not him personally, but that is he on behalf of the corporation. One of the other rights, and the most important other right, that a corporation does not have that a person does, is doesn't have the right to what we call the privileges and immunities clause, doesn't have the right to go from state to state and engage in business and so on and so forth. A corporation that is organized in the state of Utah only has the rights uh, of a corporation in the state of Utah. And they do not, as a matter of right, that corporation cannot go to Wyoming and do business, or Nevada, or Idaho, or anywhere else. If it wants to go do business in Wyoming or Idaho or Nevada, it has to go to those states and ask permission to do so and file some documents and so on and so forth. That doesn't mean they necessarily have to reincorporate, but they do have to attain, obtain a certificate to do business in those other states. Now, that's an important consideration when you decide whether you're going to be a partnership or a corporation. There are some additional expenses, obviously, involved if you're going to do business in more than one state. But with the exception of those and, and the exception that a corporation can't vote, a corporation has all of the other rights and privileges of a citizen. Uh, and a corporation is formed by filing articles of incorporation, in, and I'm going to be talking about in the state of Utah, but it's basically the same in the other 50 states, by filing articles of incorporation with the Secretary of State. And you have to pay a fee, and you have to be issued a certificate of incorporation. You have to be approved by the state of Utah. And the statutes of the state of Utah 
indicate a number of prerequisites before you can incorporate. The ones that I think will be most important uh, to most of you are that you have to have at least three incorporators. Those are people who sign the document that goes to the Secretary of State and indicates that it's all true and correct. And you have to have at least three. Again, people come in and say, well, I don't have you know, three in my business. I'm the only one. Can I incorporate myself? And the answer is yes. Uh, you can be the sole owner and own all the stock, but you still have to have three incorporators. So you may have to go get your wife and your mother-in-law or your brother or your sister or whatever it is to be one of those other two people to help you incorporate. They do not need to own any of the stock or be owners of the business. You also have to have three on the board of directors. Usually in a small corporation like most of you would be considering, those same three would be the same three as our incorporators. Uh, and they have to be three different people. Now, the law requires that you have at least three officers, a president, a vice president, and a secretary, but one person can hold the same office. So one person can be the president and vice president, another person can be the secretary and treasurer and so on. There, there you can have some overlap, but you cannot with respect to the first three. Yeah? Is there a reciprocity among the states in incorporation? No, there isn't. That is, what happens if I'm a Utah corporation and I go to Idaho? Uh, and, and maybe my answer wasn't correct. There's some reciprocity in this respect. That is, if I go to Idaho and I want to do business and I'm a Utah corporation, what Idaho requires is that I file in Idaho a copy of my Utah Articles of Incorporation. And they have to, in fact, be sworn to by the Secretary of State that they are filed and they're true and correct and so on. But I just take those articles that are filed in Utah, I file them in Idaho, I pay a fee in Idaho. They've always got to get their pound of flesh, and you pay them $50 or $100 or whatever, and then they will approve you to do business in Idaho. Okay, so if you are incorporated in a particular state, like you do not have to reincorporate in other states. That's correct. Now, I'm, I'm speaking generally. Business license type of deal. Yeah, you still have to get business licenses, and you still have to get a certificate to do business in that state. That is, in, in the other state. Okay, because the state of Delaware, you can incorporate within the state of Delaware, be president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer. You, as a sole owner, can be the corporation and do not have to have two other additional people for mm -hmm. incorporating. This being the case, you are legally incorporated within the state of Delaware. Does this mean then that Utah and Idaho and will recognize this incorporation, or will they make you reincorporate and get a president, vice president, secretary? No, they will recognize, Utah will, and I, don't, and I assume most of the other states uh, are the same, but Utah will recognize that Delaware incorporation. You'll still have to pay taxes here and, and so on on the business you do here, but they will recognize it. That's not, you know, it used to be in Delaware, if you turned around three times and blew in the wind, you could incorporate. And that's why a lot of the corporations in the country uh, were or are Delaware corporations. In fact, a lot of the big corporations are because they didn't have to have annual filings. They didn't have to pay a lot of taxes. They didn't have to do a lot of things. Delaware has changed a great deal of that, by the way, and it's still easier than some states, but it's not as easy as it used to be. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I, and, I, and that wouldn't surprise me, uh, but they have, in fact, uh, closed a lot of those, uh, what they used to feel would be advantages. It turned out that Delaware was getting a tremendous uh, burden with respect to all the corporations they were there and found out they couldn't service them like they ought to under their present rules. But keep in mind one thing, and that happens off uh, Nevada, for instance. Uh, there's a number of reasons uh, why Nevada seems to be a little easier to, to incorporate in or may have some advantages for some corporations to be a Nevada corporation. And there are a number of people who come in every year and say, John, I, you know, I want to incorporate, and I'm going to do business here, but I want to go incorporate in Nevada because I can get this, that, and the other advantage. That's something you ought to look at very, very carefully, whether it's Delaware, Nevada, or otherwise, because you then are beholding to two states. And even if you're a Delaware corporation, you do have to be uh, beholding to Delaware in terms of annual reports and minimum taxes now and so on and so forth, and also to the state of Utah. There is a minimum tax that you pay here. You have to file an annual report. You have to have a registered agent, and that's another thing to, to yes. recognize. In every state you do business, you at least have to have a registered agent for service of process or service of information. Uh, every year, the Secretary of State of Utah sends out these annual report forms. and. 
sometimes I think, unfortunately, I'm the registered agent for maybe 150 different corporations, and so I get a stack of these things in the mail about like this. The purpose for that is there has to be one person in each state where they can send the information to, or where if somebody wants to file a suit against a corporation, they can serve and say, you know, you are the corporation. It doesn't have to be an officer or a director or anybody else. It just has to be one person that the corporation agrees for those purposes is authorized to accept service and information and so on. Yeah. yeah they uh, considered uh, Delaware, what Delaware is to incorporate, uh, Nevada was to divorces. Yeah, and that's, and that's what it's been for a, lot of for a lot of years. Delaware, as I say, is, I was going to say cleaning up its act. I don't know if that's the right uh, term to use or not, but it's changing a lot. Did you have a question? Right in the second row. I passed you by a minute ago, and I didn't mean to. Other than the advantages and disadvantages between a corporation and a partnership, are you going to get into that? Yes, I am. Okay. They'll probably win, and you won't be able to use that name. And so what you want to do if you think you're going to be doing business in more than one state is file your name, not only in Utah, but in those other states where you're doing business, or file your name for national purposes with the federal government where you get a reservation of that name across the United States. Uh, with respect to the corporation, I just want to indicate one more thing initially, and that is with respect to stockholders. The owners of a corporation are the stockholders. And in fact, you buy stock. All of you are probably familiar with that. You put your money in and buy stock, and you own a percentage of that corporation. <clears throat> the stockholders are not personally liable for the obligations of the corporation. If the corporation goes bankrupt or gets involved in a, in a suit where a, where a damage verdict is given and so on, whatever the corporation has obviously is at risk and would go towards that, but the stockholders are not personally liable, and that's one of the big helps with respect to a corporation. But re And recognize another thing under the law, and that is the stockholders elect the board of directors. And under the law, it is the board of directors who direct that corporation and who make the decision. It's not the shareholders. So you do have to be careful, even though you own the entire corporation, you still, ha as a stockholder, you still have to be careful who you put on the board of directors, because those are the people who are charged with the responsibility of running the corporation. It's not the shareholders. It's kind of like Congress. We elect Congress, but uh, we all know they don't necessarily do what we ask. So you've got to be a little bit careful in that regard. I mentioned a subchapter S corporation, and I saw some head shake. Yes, I've heard of that. The only difference between a regular corporation and, the, and a, and a, and a subchapter S corporation is for purposes of taxation. And the reason is a partnership is, ta is not taxed at all. That is, if it's ABC partnership, and I don't want to get too into taxes because you have another speaker, but Mr. A and Mr. B and Mr. C are equal partners. They are personally taxed. You do have to file a return to show what the partnership made, but if it made $30,000, the partnership is not taxed at all. Mr. A will pay on $10,000, B will pay on $10,000, and C will pay on $10,000. There's no taxation here. In a corporation, on the other hand, the corporation itself is taxed on the $30,000. So if this was now ABC Incorporated, and it made the same 30000 the business itself would pay the taxes on the 30000 These three would not. But when the business then pays its taxes, and let's say it paid $10,000 taxes, that leaves 20000 after tax net profit, and oftentimes it says, well, now we're going to pay a little dividend to each of our shareholders. Maybe we'll pay them each $5,000. That $5,000 is then taxed individually to those three people, so you get a double taxation in a corporation. When that was uh, decided, in a lot of small business corporations, they felt that wasn't fair, and for some other reasons, they came up with this subchapter S corporation where you can elect, even though you're a corporation, you can elect for tax purposes only to be treated as a partnership. And in a subchapter S corporation, the corporation doesn't pay any taxes, the shareholders do, according to their percentage ownership of the stock. That's helpful not so much in splitting up profits this way, but it's helpful if you show a loss for the first year or two, 
then each one of those individuals can individually take a portion of the loss on their own income tax returns, and you can come up with some substantial tax benefits that way. So it's kind of a question of, of watching your business and deciding when you ought to elect to do that and when you ought to elect to be taxed as a regular corporation, and you can make a change. There's a whole lot of rules, and I, and I really don't have time to get into them, number two, but I think I may be stepping on some toes later, so I don't want to get into somebody else's area. Just recognize that it's a big decision, and it's something you ought to have some help from a CPA or an accountant on. Uh, and your CPA can tell you whether you need a CPA or just a regular accountant. But I'll tell you this uh, from a legal standpoint, and he'll probably tell you from a tax standpoint. The very first income tax return that you file will make anywhere from 12 to 16 different decisions that most of you will never know you're making unless you go out and get some help from an attorney and or a CPA in order to find out what tax year should I have? Do I want the LIFO or FIFO inventory system? Do I want this, uh, the cash or the accrual system? And there's a number of them that are made just simply by filing the return that are absolutely irreversible. Uh, and you better have some help. But if you don't get any help from an attorney or a CPA after that, make sure you get some help initially to set up your books with a CPA to make those decisions and to, and to make sure those basic decisions are made properly to begin with. Some can be changed later, but some can't. Uh, let me, in the time I've got left, and I've got about six or seven minutes is all, uh, give you some of the considerations that you'll want to think about in terms of making some of those decisions. First of all, the difficulty in deciding is usually, usually only happens with small businesses like we're talking about because major national businesses have those decisions made for them. First of all, you'd want to know the number of parties involved. Uh, if it's going to be a large number, that may push you uh, to a corporation. A partnership may be unwieldy. If there's only one involved, you may want to just remain a, a proprietorship and so on. Secondly, you ought to think about the capital necessities, and one of the speakers is going to talk about that later on this afternoon. Uh, partnership hazards often hurt uh, going out and getting capital because everybody realizes that they're depending on other partners and they're fully liable for the acts and obligations of those partners, and sometimes that hurts... Uh, people who, who would otherwise put money into the business. Uh, the unlimited liability hurts going out and getting capital sometimes with respect to a partnership. Income, the division of the income and the manner of the income is another thing that will perhaps steer you towards a corporation or a partnership. And again, please remember that that needs to be thoroughly and completely discussed and agreed upon before you ever start your business. Otherwise, you're going to have a problem or you might very well have one. Uh, another item that may be important is governmental regulation. A corporation has to put up with a lot more governmental regulation and red tape than does a sole proprietor, although everybody these days has to put up with a lot. And it's getting worse and worse. Uh, you just wouldn't believe all of the regulation you have to put up with, even if you're just a sole proprietor. But a corporation is a little more expensive because there's more paperwork and there's more things you have to file and you have to to match uh, some additional taxes and so on and so forth. So you have a few of those kind of governmental regulation that you ought to discuss with your accountant and perhaps your attorney before you get involved, and that may help you make some decisions. Taxation is usually the single biggest factor in making that decision as to whether you want to be a proprietorship, a partnership, or a corporation, although now that you can move back and forth with some of these uh, tax decisions, it's not as important as it used to be, but it still probably remains the single biggest uh, item as to why. Transferability of interest is another thing you ought to consider. Remember I told you partnership, you can't get in and out of that fast. You get in a partnership, if you want to get out, it may end the partnership. Uh, corporation, on the other hand, you can buy stock in the corporation and that's freely traded. You can transfer that and sell it back and forth and it doesn't affect the corporation at all. Timing might be an important uh, situation. If you want to get in business tomorrow because you have something you need to take advantage of, literally tomorrow, you may have to start out as a partnership because it's going to take you maybe a week or two to become incorporated, even if you do it real fast. So you may want to start out as a partnership, take advantage of that particular opportunity, and then change later on to become a corporation. And you can do that tax-free, by the way, if you do it properly and if the same partners are involved in the corporation and so on. Uh, a couple of the other things you might want to think about are two or more whose contributions are different, whether you want to make that into a corporation or a partnership because of the different kinds of contributions that are made, or a limited partnership, as the case may be, and so on. 
You may want to consider business dealings uh, with different organizations or entities. Sometimes uh, partnerships can do that better than corporations or vice versa. You'll obviously want to think about liability. If you're in a type of business where liability runs high with the public or liability runs high with anyone else for that matter, you may want to lean towards a corporation to get that protection from liability. That can be overrated. I think uh, a lot of attorneys even overrate that, you know, and scare you into becoming a corporation because of some, you know, uh, uh, threats of worries about liabilities and so on. There are some businesses where that doesn't need to be a threat, uh, given the insurance and so on that you can buy, and that your liability just your exposure isn't that great. So that might be another area uh, that you'll want to consider. Let me do one, uh, one final thing that I think might help, and I'm running kind of fast here, but, but I think that would maybe summarize what I've given you in terms of advantages and disadvantages between the three. Maybe it'll summarize the comments I've made. In terms of a sole proprietorship, if I had to list two or three advantages, I think that one of the first ones would be that it's easily created and it's obviously easily terminated. That's just you yourself. You don't have to file with anybody other than to get business licenses and so on, but you don't have to file with anybody. You don't have to get anything approved or disapproved, and you make all the decisions. Maybe that's the second advantage, that, that uh, it's pure undiluted uh, uh, action and control. You make the decisions yourself. Great deal of flexibility. Uh, a minimum of regulation and taxation. Uh, as I say, everybody puts up with a lot, but as compared to a partnership uh, or a corporation, it has a minimum of, uh, of government regulation and taxation. And finally, all the rewards go to the owner, obviously, in a, in a proprietorship. If you make a lot of money, you get all the rewards. You don't share it with anybody. Some of the disadvantages of a sole proprietorship, where you own everything yourself, is unlimited liability. A sole proprietor is also, just like a partner in a partnership, totally liable for whatever happens in the business, right down to his bootstraps. Uh, you have a lot of management limitations. You have a lot of capital limitations. If it's just you yourself, if you want to go out and borrow money or you want to go out and make some smart decisions in terms of, of management or expansion or so on, you don't have anybody in the business to bounce those off of or work with or so on. You've got to go out and hire somebody and bring them in, where that may not be true in a partnership or a corporation. Uh, and the last one, I suppose, would be uh, the flip side of an advantage. That is, if you die, the business dies if you're a sole proprietorship. If you get sick, the business gets sick. And so there's a lot of problems if you're just by yourself. Moving to a general partnership. Advantages, uh, obviously, are pooling of resources. Where you get more, more than just one involved, you get a lot of advantages in a lot of different areas. Uh, you have a better ability to gain capital, if for no other reason than you've got two people's financial statements to go out and borrow on as opposed to one. You may have two people's uh, talent and two people's experience and so on, all of which, as you'll find out later today, go into whether or not a bank will give you any money. Uh, as opposed to a corporation, a partnership is perhaps more simple to operate, not always, but sometimes simpler because of a just having a partnership meeting and doing things as opposed to having everything through a board of directors and shareholders meetings and so on and so forth. Uh, limited regulation and taxation. A partnership generally is less than a corporation. A partnership or a proprietorship, uh, as I indicated before, does have the flexibility and mobility to do business anywhere in the country. They don't have to get approved in each state. Uh, so that is an advantage. Disadvantages of a partnership Number one on the list has got to be unlimited liability again. That keeps cropping up. Secondly, the tenuous existence, especially if you don't have a written partnership agreement. If something happens to one partner, the partnership is over unless you've otherwise provided for it in writing. Uh, third, as opposed to a proprietorship at least, uh, it's a little tougher to, to make management decisions and so on because you've got more than one involved. Uh, there may be some problems in terms of of uh, share liquidation upon the ending of a partnership. And I ought to mention one other thing. A partnership or a proprietorship, but a partnership uh, more because there's more involved, does have some tax liability burdens that a corporation doesn't. You recall I told you that if this is ABC partnership, each partner has to pay, ten, pay taxes on $10,000 of the profit. That is true whether or not they actually receive one dime of that profit. 
if the partnership makes 30 grand and you sit down and you say, well, let's not take any home. Let's put it back in the business and do this, that, and the other and not take it home. That's probably a good decision, but it might be a hardship because you will still pay your proportionate share uh, of the taxes on the profits, whether you take it home or not. And a corporation, that's not true. The business itself pays the taxes, and so you don't have to. But that can, again, I don't want to get too much into taxes because uh, you've got another speaker, but that is something you may want to consider. Uh, finally, with respect to corporations, some advantages and disadvantages, and, and obviously these are just the major ones. Uh, you, when you sit down with an attorney and say, this is really what we want to do, and you really get the details of your business, there might be a lot of other reasons why he'll tell you right off. You ought to be a partnership or you ought to be a corporation and so on. These that I'm going over are just the ones that, that stare at you in the face all the time. Advantage to corporations, first of all, limited liability. As a shareholder, you don't have that, uh, that problem with liability. Secondly, you're a legal entity for all purposes, just like a person. You have all the same rights, privileges, responsibilities as any other person when you're a corporation. And to be fair, most states have also given that status to partnerships, but all states haven't. So in some states, as a partnership, you may not have some of the rights you, th you think you would otherwise. Third advantage, ready transferability of ownership. You can get in and get out uh, without messing with the, uh, with the basic formation of the business. Fourth, with respect to obtaining capital, you've got generally a lot more flexibility or, or you might have a lot more flexibility in raising capital in a corporation through selling stock or th because of the limited liability and so on and so forth. Fifth, and this is a big one, employee benefits. A corporation for tax purposes and otherwise can write off a number of employee benefits, insurance and, and automobiles and so on and so forth, can write those off as business expenses where partnerships cannot. Some of those rules will probably be explained to you by your CPA. But that can be a substantial benefit uh, to you. A lot of professional people, and if any of you here are professional people, doctors, dentists, uh, lawyers, I think they now include architects and some others, can incorporate without all of the other uh, obligations that, that regular corporations. I could incorporate myself, for instance, and, and not have three directors and three officers and so on. The reasons for that is in the professions, I might not be able to find two other attorneys who want to incorporate with me. Uh, so they can incorporate all by themselves, uh, and they have some substantial benefits uh, that they can that they can have by doing so. So that's a, uh, but, but it regular corporations can too. It used to be you couldn't even have a retirement fund and write it off for tax purposes unless you were a corporation. Now that's changed. And now individuals and partnerships can do that. But the other areas of benefits, medical plans, automobiles, uh, and so on, you cannot do as a partnership or a proprietorship and write them off for tax purposes. So that's something to think about and talk with your, with your uh, CPA about. Disadvantages of corporations, uh, I think, are few, but uh, the ones that are there are maybe substantial. Legal formality and cost uh, is, is a definite disadvantage of a corporation as opposed to the other, uh, the other types. And I want to come back to that in just a second. The second disadvantage is doing business in other states. As a corporation, and we've gone over it, you have to go there and get approved and go through some red tape, appoint a registered agent in each of those states, file annual returns in each of those states, maybe pay a, a minimum $25 or $30 tax in each of those states, minimum, and so on. So there, that's a disadvantage. Uh, I don't really think there are too many other major disadvantages. Uh, maybe protection of minority interests. If you only own 10% of a corporation, you'd have a hard time protecting yourself against the 90% owners, but that's true in a partnership, too. Yeah? Doing business in other states, that doesn't include purchasing items, uh, supplies, and No, it doesn't. And that's a question in and of itself, whether you are doing business in another state. If somebody calls you from Nevada, and says, hey, I heard you sell widgets and I'd like to order three of them, and you say, fine, that doesn't mean you're doing business in Nevada. But if you are out actually soliciting business in Nevada, and not including, by the way, uh, an ad in Time Magazine or a, you know that kind of a thing where people do it on mail order, but if you're actually out with a salesman in an office or either one under some circumstances and, and actually soliciting business, then you may, in fact, have to qualify to do business. States sort of look at it, if you're taking advantage of our laws and getting the benefits of our laws, you're doing that much business, you ought to have to pay us to do business here. Let me just say one other thing, and then I'll be done and answer miscellaneous questions. With respect to legal formality and cost, I think it's important for me to maybe give you an idea of what those are. Uh, 
legal formality, obviously, is because you have to file things and answer all those questions. The cost, uh, again, I'm giving you averages in the state of Utah. You're probably going to be looking about an average of 500 to $600, uh, including attorney's fees and filing fees and the other things you need uh, to incorporate in the state of Utah. It may be substantially more, depending upon special circumstances. It may be a little less. Uh, but generally not too much less, if you get what I think you ought to have. Now let me just tell you four or five things that when you go to an attorney to incorporate, I think you ought to find out uh, whether or not he provides. I knew an attorney once, I still know him, who uh, incorporates people for $50. And it costs you $50, by the way, to file with the Secretary of State. So in fact, he was doing the work for free. Uh, and sending the corporations up. The problem was he didn't give you anything else other than to file with the Secretary of State, and then he said to you, great, you're a corporation. You know, and you say, well, how do I act? What do I do? You know, I, wh where do I turn? The reason he did it uh, is because he figured he'd then get the corporate business later on and it would be a good loss leader. But I don't believe that does you a service. And the things that any attorney, as you go talk to them, and, and by the way, if you're going to pick an attorney, uh, don't feel shy at all about asking him what he's going to charge you. Some people feel like that's a question they ought not to ask. You certainly ought to ask it, and you're, and you're foolish if you don't, because you hate to go have a consultation and get a bill for 300 bucks and wonder why he did that, you know. Uh, ask him what he's going to charge you. Ask him whether he charges on an hourly basis or if he charges by the particular thing he does, whether he charges you for consultation, whether he charges you for telephone calls, and what he charges. And, and make sure you get that straightened uh, right away. And don't feel badly about going to two or three different attorneys and kind of getting a feeling for, you know, am I getting a proper deal with this guy or that guy, and is he charging me properly, and do I get along with him? I think that's one thing about an attorney that just like a doctor, I'd hate to go have a doctor as my family doctor and when I go in and I'm sick and he says, go in my next room and get undressed and I say, no, I won't do that. You know, you got to do that with your attorney. You got to get undressed in terms of your problems and if there's somebody there that you don't feel comfortable with in terms of telling him the problems and that goes for CPA. My accountant, I've called many a time and said, geez, I sure did a stupid thing. You won't believe this, you know, and get me out of it. And that's embarrassing. But I'm glad I've got a guy I can call to do that because I'd take some substantial business losses if I hadn't done that in a number of occasions. So get an attorney with whom you feel comfortable, who you can go bear your soul to and ask the questions and feel confident in his, his advice. That's very, very important. Uh, but when you go specifically for a corporation, I didn't mean to digress, but when you go specifically for a corporation, find out whether or not that includes, I think the following should be minimums. Articles of incorporation, obviously. It ought to also include some minutes and bylaws. The bylaws of a corporation are different than the articles. They are the day-to-day -day rules and regulations for a corporation, and they are, although not required specifically by the statutes, they are referred to in the statutes, and they're, they're a must in any corporation. You ought to get what I call a corporate kit. That includes your stock certificates. A corporation has to issue stock certificates and has to have shareholders or it's not in business and it's not a corporation. And most of these $50 corporations, these people never issue stock certificates. They've never seen one, they don't know how to do it, and so on. And they're not corporations. Uh, it ought to include sample minutes and bylaws of board of directors meetings and shareholders meetings. And I think one thing that I require of anybody that I incorporate because I feel so strongly about it is I require that I sit down with them or that they sit down with me to have their first board of directors meeting. And in that meeting, we approve all of the necessary things that need to be approved in a corporation. Bank accounts, we elect our officers, we elect our directors, and so on. We make all those approvals. We give our blessing to everything that's happened uh, up to that point in time, and so on. All of those things that make us official. We issue the stock, we state what's paid for it, and that it's issued, and all, there's a lot of other things. But I require that uh, because I think it's so important. And before a corporation leaves my office, they know what they have to do when they leave. How often do they have to have meetings? How do they make minutes? When do they have a shareholders meeting? All of that sort of stuff. Because if you don't act like a corporation and you don't behave according to the laws, you'll lose that Gardal shield and you'll be back to a partnership whether you want to be or not in terms of liability. So uh, discuss that with your attorney. And, and it's sometimes tough to pick an attorney. I, uh, I think of one last uh, closing story about attorneys. Uh, there's, a, there's an attorney uh, back east 
uh, by the name, and I, I don't know if it was James or, or Bob or something, anyway, E. Strange. I remember the last name because that was a good name for an attorney. And he was always active uh, in civil uh, projects and Chamber of Commerce and Lions Club and so on and so forth. And when he was about ready to retire from his legal practice, they had a dinner for him. Uh, they told him they were going to put a statue of him in the square because he'd been such a tremendous citizen. And, and I remember he spoke and said, no, I really don't want that. He said, I really don't want a statue. I've never been that kind of a guy. It would embarrass me when I'm living and when I'm dead. All I'd like you to do is I'd just like you to put on my tombstone. Here lies a lawyer and an honest man. And he says, as people walk by and look at that, they'll always know. They'll say, hmm, that's strange. And he said, the, uh, <laughs> the interesting thing was, is when the people walked by, the first thing they said was, why'd they bury them both in the same grave? So it didn't work after all. But <laughs> nevertheless, pick your attorney carefully. Any other uh, questions that I didn't get to? Yeah. You can't, and that's a good point. Uh, on a professional corporation, you cannot get away from the, the uh, limited liability with respect to uh, uh, relationships with your clients. In other words, I could not incorporate as an attorney, be guilty of malpractice, and then say, sorry, I'm a corporation. Uh, you do have some of the liabilities of a corporation, or excuse me, some of the protections of a liability, but it, uh, protections of a corporation from liabilities, but you cannot get around uh, relationships with clients, which in my case would be malpractice or a doctor or an architect or so on. Yeah. Do you feel it's necessary to have a uh, lawyer on retainer or just go to them whenever you need them? I don't. In fact, I would discourage. I discourage clients who come in and ask to be, you know, to retain us on a retainer basis. We do have some clients that do that for a number of different reasons. But for a small business, I don't think it's necessary and I think it's unwise to pay an attorney X dollars a month whether you use him or not. First of all, because usually he'll make that a deal where you pay him that minimum, whether you use him or not, and if you use him more than that minimum, he'll charge you the extra. And if you don't use him, he'll expect his retainer anyway. I've always been a believer in the fact that people ought to pay me for what I do, and they ought not to pay me for what I don't do. And I think as a small businessman, generally, unless you have some, and there are some reasons for retainers, but I wouldn't put an attorney on retainer. Uh, I'd just go to him and pay him for, for what he does. I know my time's about up. Uh, maybe we can answer one more question if there is one. I don't know. Looks like we're okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I think you can see from this morning's speakers that the uh, quality has been really very fine. And... Uh, this afternoon, I think you'll follow, You'll see that we follow through on that. We've got some really fine people uh, that are expert in their field lined up to talk. Now, it's time for lunch break. And uh, for those of you who have registered uh, with us, you should have uh, what looks like a theater ticket. If you don't have that, uh, then I need to see you so, you so that you're legal. Get John Adams after you. Um, the luncheon is in the multipurpose room. In your packet, you have a, a little map of campus. We're all going to walk over there in mass anyway, but if you have something else you want to do first, you can find us by looking at that little map. We are, we are in the Rampton Technology Building, and just due west of us is the College Center. I think it's CC on your map. As you go in this north entrance to the College Center, you go through the first set of glass doors, and there's two sets. You walk into the first set of glass doors, and in the middle, between the doors on the east and the doors on the west, in the middle there's a stairwell that goes down into the basement of the college center. And that uh, is where we need to have you in the multipurpose room downstairs. So you don't go all the way into the college center, just in through the first set of glass doors, and then down the interior stairwell to the multipurpose room. So let's dismiss right now then, go down there, and we'll reconvene back here at uh, 1.15. There's a, a lot of time uh, allowed for you to come back and to uh, experiment with these computers or to tour campus or whatever you'd like. You can leave your materials here if you'd like.
fine bookkeepers that uh, work out of the home. Maybe they have an office in their home, in front of their home, that do basically bookkeeping services or they do tax services. And those bookkeepers are usually your lowest rate to get someone that has, has some experience in accounting or bookkeeping. And their rates are anywhere from maybe uh, $10 an hour to $15, $20 an hour in that range for you. Above them are a group of people that are called public accountants. Public, we, we started our accountancy law here in Utah back in 1959, was the first accountancy law. And before that time, there, were, there was no licensing in effect. At that time, all the fellows that were in practice, having accounting practices and bookkeeping practices, were given a license as public accountants in the state. The ones that are left, there's only about 75 left. And since, that, since 1959, there have been no new public accounting licenses issued. And there's about 75 of those fellows around. And the ones that are left have developed very successful practices. And because of the ever-changing nature of our profession, they're good because of the fact that they are still in business. So that's a, that's a group. That, that group usually runs from anywhere from $15 an hour on up to $25 an hour. Then you have your local CPA firms or your local practitioners, which may be anywhere from one to two or five uh, fellows in a firm. Uh, they usually will have three different rates. They'll probably have a partner rate at anywhere from $25 to $45 an hour. They'll have a senior accountant rate, uh, fellows that have been with them that are doing a lot of the senior accounting type work, and they'll run, say, $15 to $20 an hour for them, and then they'll have a clerical rate they'll charge you if any of their secretaries do anything for you at around maybe $15 to $20 an hour. You go on up from that to the, to the medium-sized CPA firms. They range in, in rates from $45 to uh, $65 an hour. You get on downtown, you get into some of your large 25 fellows, 25 CPAs in a firm, and they're going to charge you partner time of about uh, anywhere from $55 to $75, $85 an hour partner time. And then, of course, the only reason you need to have a big eight CPA firms, and when we say big eight, we mean the largest eight CPA firms in the entire United States of America who have their local offices here. And they'll charge you around $125 to $150 an hour for partner time. So this gives you an, hour, an idea of what is out in the community. And as you're starting, don't rush down and buy the highest price thing. Why, maybe plug into the system where you might want to. I see a question. Well, yeah, I think uh, let's take let's take uh, the real big jump. Maybe let's take the big eight CPA firms downtown. Okay, they've got national offices, and normally they're just going to service Kennecott Copper and your largest corporations anyway. Okay, they need a staff because they're handling some very complicated international questions and uh, they very sophisticated problems, and the research <clears throat> in that is is very difficult. Let me point out, maybe to give you an insight into that, for, for taxes. <clears throat> uh, wh when we have uh, the Internal Revenue Code, then we have uh, Internal Revenue Service regulations, and then we have Internal Revenue Service rulings, and then we have tax cases. Okay, now when you get your package at home in the mail that says, here's your forms to fill out your 1979 tax returns, you're going to be reading the Internal Revenue Code. That's what Congress passed into law. <clears throat> that's fine for a W-2, and that's fine for a, for a very simple tax return. Okay. However, as soon as the law is passed, and we've had three major laws in the last three years. We had the Tax Reform Act of 1976. We had the Tax, reg we had the tax uh, Reduction and Simplification Act of 77, and neither reduced nor simplified your taxes. <laughs> but that's the name Congress put on it. And we had the Revenue Act of 78, okay? All of those are new Internal Revenue Codes coming out, new laws that are coming out. But as soon as they come out, the Internal Revenue Service starts issuing regulations regarding their interpretation of that code. And they may say, well, Congress was in a big hurry in the last few hours, and they said this in black and white, but they really meant that. So they have regulations which will be contrary to the code. And then 
the, the very large taxpayers who have large issues and have enough money to afford it will then hire a tax attorney because they have a special thing and they want to get around the Internal Revenue Code or they want to approach it to see if they can get a special circumstance and there's enough gray area or enough interpretation in the law, uh, that a loophole, if you want to call it that, that they might try for, they'll have a tax attorney or a tax CPA prepare a ruling and mail it off to the IRS and say, we've got a special deal here, we've got a special circumstance, and this is why we believe that you should go just opposite to what Congress passed and give us a special thing up here so we can get a $100,000 or $500,000 deduction or exclude this income from taxation. And the IRS comes back and agrees with them, and there's an entire staff in New York City of law, or excuse me, Washington, D.C., of lawyers that are sending back rulings. Okay, the rulings are published. And then if the very rich taxpayer who can afford this doesn't get any satisfaction here, he said, well, I still don't agree with you. We're going to take you to, take you to tax court. And the tax court then, the judge may completely agree with the taxpayer and say Congress was really unfair, it was not equitable as to what they did, and the tax case then will be uh, adjudicated in favor of the taxpayer. So if you're just filing W-2, you don't need to worry about all this other stuff. If you're a big corporation like Kennecott Copper, you better know the latest tax cases and you better know the latest rulings and the regulations and that kind of give you an idea of what, what they're doing down at the big eight CPA firms and why they charge so much for all that research. A small local practitioner is, uh, is, is going to be good and he's going to stay up on uh, as much of this as he can. In the last three years, there have been 65,000 rulings and regulations passed. Probably in your particular business, only maybe 10 or 15 would apply to your particular kind of business. So you see there, there's a lot to stay up with. And that may, be account, may account for some of that difference in price. But that gives you an idea of the structure and what's available for you out in the market. I've got uh, on this handout that will be given to you this afternoon, we've got a little checklist of how do you choose an accountant. And let me just run over those very rapidly for you. Uh, the, one of the best ways is to get about five leads from other successful businessmen or from bankers or from someone that you trust and someone that has a position of uh, trust for you. Someone, like I say, your banker, your businessman, your attorney if you already have one. Let them refer you to someone. Uh, set up interviews with the accountants that you might want to talk with and go over and meet them. Take your prior two or three years tax returns and let them look at that. They'll normally have that first session with you free of charge to, uh, to review your tax returns to see if uh, there's anything, that, any mistake that have been, have been made. If you've been taking them to H&R um, uh, Block, I hate to say that word, but H&R Block, uh, there may be a case that uh, you may have had a complicated situation that somebody with a very short period of training may have missed the boat. And the CPA will normally, or accountant will normally be glad to review those tax returns with you free in the first interview. Um, ask for a ballpark figure, what they're going to charge you. Find out, find out in advance exactly what your fees are going to be. Uh, make sure that these people are willing to work around your low budget when you're just starting your, your business. Uh, look, at, look at their accounting work, I mean look at their office space rather, and see what kind of impression you get. <laughs> I went in, a, I hate to say this, but I went in a CPA's office one time, and this guy was so messy, not only did I have to walk over other people's records, your records from your business as I was getting into his office, but even his calendar was askew on the wall. And this guy was so disorganized, uh, it would, took him, he had to look in five drawers before he found the piece of paper that, that I came over to his office to find. Well, you might have some risk in dealing with an accountant like that. So I would suggest that you deal with somebody that, that they may have a lot of files around, but hopefully they're organized and, and they'll be able to find your work when you go back to get it. <clears throat> Those are just some of the tips and looking. And as I say, I'm leaving this for you and take this with you and read it over. I think that's good. <clears throat> One of the things that, let me give you some buzzwords that, that you used to be in the profession and they're now in the profession, accounting profession. We used to have what we call unaudited financial statements and audited financial statements. That's all we had was unaudited and audited. <clears throat> of course, when you're just starting out, all you need is an audited financial, unaudited financial statement. And unless you get in very large amounts of money with a banker, I don't think he's going to want you to go spend a lot of money on an audited financial. All an audited financial means is that some independent person 
like a CPA, goes and checks out everything you've said to make sure it's right through an independent source. If you say it's you got land, he goes and checks your title, make sure you got land. If he said if you say you've got accounts receivable, he sends a letter out to every one of your accounts receivable and says confirm directly back to me that you do owe that company money. If you've got inventory, he doesn't take your word for it. He counts every piece of your inventory. All, an, all a CPA does in an audit is independently verify that the numbers that he comes with up for you comes up with for you or you come up with are independently checked. And that costs a lot of money because it costs a lot of his time. Well, now the accounting profession in July of this last year have come out with a new, three new buzzwords. They're called compiled financials, reviewed financials, and audited financials. Compiled financials are just the same as unaudited financials used to be. That's where you take your stuff down to the CPA and you give it to him, and maybe you give it to him in a shoebox, maybe you give it to him in some nice records. However you give it to him, he prepares a balance sheet and an income statement, and he gives you the balance sheet and income statement back. And then he puts a letter on the front of that, and he says, I don't know anything about this stuff. They just gave me this. I take no responsibility for this, and I just added it all up, and it does add, and I put it in the right place, and I've given it back to him so he can take it to you, Mr. Banker, Mr. Loan Company. That's a compile financial. Same thing an unaudited used to be. Now, in between unaudited and audited, we've come up with a new group of financials, which as your business grows, you want to know about. It's called reviewed financial statements. Now, reviewed financial statements is where the CPA says, okay, he gave me this information, or, or maybe I developed the information for him, but I also looked at his business. I looked at his accounting procedures. I looked at the policies of his business. I did analytical reviews of his business. I really went in there and, and checked him out uh, without going to independent parties. But from my own check, I went in and, and I as a CPA, we as a CPA think that uh, we see nothing wrong that we can tell on the surface. Okay, so it gives you a, a, a sort of a negative assurance, uh, I think is the way, way you might say it. But the CPA is giving more credibility to your financial statements. And it's cheaper because he doesn't have to do all those independent outside checks. And then, of course, the third thing is still just like we always had the full audited set of financial statements. And normally the only time you're going to need an audited set of financial statements is if you're going for a very, very large loan or if you're in a special bonding situation or something like that. So when you're just starting off with your business, why try to use just what you need at that point. <clears throat> now when you're just getting started, the best, you're going you're to be at some point in your business you're going to have one of these abilities. I always like to draw a circle. That's, that's all I know about anything. I have to go from there. Well, we start off up here and you've got sales ability. Then you've got to produce the product. And then you've got to be able to build a product Bill for your services, and you've got to be able to collect. And now you're going to have one of those one of those personalities, and you're going to have one of those abilities, and you've got to acquire the rest of those abilities. When you're a small businessman, you've got to wear all the hats. Or as you get larger and you can afford them, maybe you can go to somebody else to tap into some of that knowledge. Uh, you've got to have that sales ability to get out there and sell your services. Obviously, and the rest of the fellows today have talked about marketing and those those parts of it. That takes a special personality. It takes a guy that's up. It takes a guy that goes out and is able to sell a service. A special personality or a part of your personality that you should develop through Dale Carnegie courses or whatever you want to do. Production and the, the ability to be able to meet a deadline. The ability to be able to furnish that product to that man when you said you were going to furnish it to him and give him the quality that you said you were going to be, to be able to deliver what you, you sold him. That takes another personality because it takes a guy that's going to stay there till midnight or 3 in the morning and instead of leaving at 2 o'clock in the afternoon to go play golf or something. A special personality and a lot of ability in this area. Maybe you already have, maybe you're at this point and you're trying to plug into sales. Maybe you're sales and you're trying to get a product. Then you've got to be able to convince the man that you've, you've delivered the product to him and you're billing him and his product was worth it and you give him a good bill and that takes some ability there. And then an entirely different personality is the collection personality. And you, businesses fail at any of these levels because they don't have the ability. And you can fail at any point. The collection point is one that's it's very, very uh, appropriate to 1980 because we're going in, we're in a recession. 
and uh, we've got a lot of people that are writing receivables. Well, you have to be, you have to have a, a system of aging of accounts receivable. In 30 days, you've got to take one action, 60 days, 90 days. If you got, get bogged down over here in production or sales, and you're not making sure you collect your receivables, your business is going to fail. And so out here in this 90-day column and on out here, you have to be a real mean character, or you, at least you have to put on the real mean hat for that. So anyway, what I'm saying is that it takes different personalities and, and different uh, aspects to the business. Now, if you don't have that ability yourself, okay, if you don't have the knowledge yourself, then you've got to acquire that knowledge from somewhere. Free seminars like this is an excellent place. The Small Business Administration is excellent. The SCORE and ACE, ACE volunteers that are down there are all fine gentlemen, and they're volunteering their time. They're retired, and they want to come out and help, help people get started in business, and it's an excellent source for you to go to. But let me give you some numbers from just the standpoint of my aspect, the accounting thing. If you're going to have, and this is a handout, so I'm just going to read over this. You don't have to write it down. I'm just going to kind of read over it, and it's a handout for you to take with you today. <clears throat> you're going to need to find out about the local agencies and what you're going to need to do. For sales tax, if you're going to have sales tax on your sales, we've got the Utah Sales and Use Tax down the State Tax Commission. We've got their telephone number on here for you. If you're going to have with employees, you're going to need a special withholding number. If you're going to have employees, you've got to get two numbers for your business. Both of those businesses, both of those numbers are in effect Social Security numbers for your business. One is a Social Security number at the state, and the other was a Social Security number at the federal government. They're not called that, uh, but they're called employer identification numbers. The federal government will give you an 87 number, 87 dash, six numbers after it, and that's in the federal government's computer for your business, and all uh, federal withholding payments and so forth are made to that. The state has, will, will issue you a special number also, so you've got to get those two numbers if you're going to go into business, and we've got those numbers down here. For your job service, if you're going to have employees, then you're going to have to register with job service and pay a tax. They call it a contribution. Uh, you have to pay a tax for running the job service system. And incidentally, Utah, for the last two to three years, has been number one in the nation for our Department of, of Unemployment Security because they try to get the guy another job. And uh, this is so much better than the fellows out in California that are getting the food stamps and coming here to ski at Snowbird. I mean, at least, uh, <laughs> at least we're trying to, trying to get the people a job and the people work hard down there. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see, but they tax the business. They gotta get the money from somewhere, so you as a businessman are taxed whenever you start a payroll system. Now, the other, the other way that you may not wanna start a payroll system yet, and that's then hiring subcontractors. Okay, you need some other people to help you get what you're going to do done, right? So you're going to get the next two or three guys, or they're going to work for you, and you're going to put them on a W-2, and they're going to be employees, or they're going to be subcontractors, independent contractors themselves. Okay, that's the two ways to go and the two decisions you have to make. The IRS has a list of 20 questions that they ask you when you go into an IRS audit as to whether the people working for you are subcontractors or employees. To just give you a couple of guidelines real quickly, one guideline is, does the, does the clerk come in and stand behind the counter and you tell her to stand right there and tell her to sell that merchandise at that price? Okay, then she's a, an employee. You're giving her specific directions. Uh, or if you tell her, okay, take this piece off of here and nail that nail to it and put it right over here, then you're giving her specific in, in, uh, instructions. However, what if a guy was a drywall man and he, his job, he, a general contractor had hired him to go drywall 10 houses. He didn't care how he did it. He just wanted 10 houses drywall by two weeks from now. Well, you as this main subcontractor, drywall subcontractor, might want to hire a couple of other guys to go do some of the other houses. Well, you don't go over there and tell them what to do. You just say, go do lot number two and go do lot number five. And, and when you come back, tell me how much I owe you. Well, those guys are subcontractors. You haven't given them any directions except generally go do the job. So that's a couple of real quick and very simple ways to try to understand subcontractors and employees. Question? Okay, the subcontractor, if I hire somebody to work for me in a subcontract situation, and they're not, they don't have a business license, they're not normally involved in that, maybe they've got a full-time job someplace else, how much trouble am I in? <laughs> no, they don't necessarily have to have a business license. I think the, the county would want them to have a business license. It's only like $15. How do I justify but, the expenditure? Without them having a business license. 
you don't have any liability on your books if they don't have a business license. They're the only one that have a little liability to the county or the city for not having a license and, and very nominal liability at that. So on your books, you can hire, it all depends upon whether you're withholding or not. If a, if a person is a truly an employee under the IRS guidelines and you hire them as a subcontractor and don't pay Social Security on them and don't withhold their federal, federal and don't withhold their state, then you are liable for all the Social Security. You know, right now in 79, it was 6.13% was taken from the employee's paycheck, and it had to be matched by 6.13% from the employer, making a total of 12.26%. Well, if you didn't withhold that, and the IRS came back and found you to be in an employer-employee relationship, you'd have to pay the full 12.26%. So you'd have both sides of it, plus a little penalty and interest. So that's your main exposure. Now, workman's compensation, if you've got employees or got fellows working on a job that might get hurt, you want to be sure to go to the state insurance fund, and their, their number is on there. The state insurance fund is funded partly by, the, by our state government and is subsidized and is the cheapest place you can get workman's compensation insurance. And almost every insurance carrier, insurance man will tell you that thing, same thing also, because they just can't match the prices, and it's a, real, it's a cheap amount to pay for a guy losing a couple of fingers or a wrist or the medical cost and the, and the workman's compensation cost. And I would certainly recommend that you go to the state insurance fund and get some workman's compensation insurance. So I've covered just a few of those uh, types of agencies. There's a couple of more listed on there. Internal Revenue Service. Uh, question? I have a question on the state insurance. If you, if you, have, if you don't have employees, all right, do you still get this insurance? Uh, no, I think it's just on employees. I'm, I may have to. I'm, I'm not sure of that answer. So call them. Call this well, number. If you were a you got it. Got well, the question was, if you're hiring people as subcontractors versus employees, can you get insurance from the state insurance fund to cover the subcontractors? No, because it's based on a percentage of your payroll. If it doesn't appear as, as payroll in your records, right, you I th can't be billed for a premium. I think Sam's, a Sam's right on it. Yeah. But they are... They are very nice people down there. I've dealt with them a lot, and they will be glad to answer all your questions and explain the, all of the details about the state insurance fund to you. So call this number that's on our sheet there, and if you have any questions. In fact, all of these agencies are very, very will help you a great deal, I think, except uh, the IRS during this particular time when they're doing a lot of tax preparer assistance. They have a hard time uh, getting to them sometimes. Now let's talk about a simple bookkeeping system. Okay, you're just starting your business. One of the simplest bookkeeping systems you can keep, and it is a very small charge to you, is the bank charges that you charge your, that the bank charges. So if the bank is charging you $5 a month, they're keeping your books for you. And if you'll just use your bank, then you're developing your basic bookkeeping system. So many people, when they first start out in business, they just commingle all of the business money with their personal money and put it in their personal account. And then they go through, and at the end of the year, it's very, very difficult for you to spread everything out. And you're trying to find out what's a personal check and what's a business check, and so you really go back through your whole, per live your whole personal life all over again. But the first suggestion I have to you, and the simplest thing to do, is set up a separate business account at the bank. Then all of the income that you receive from whatever business you're going to, put it in that business account, and all those deposits right on the right on the deposit slip as you make it or on your own records a little copy of your deposit slip as you make it what the source of that money was now the source of the money is of course going to be sales or it may be transfer from your personal account to that account to get the business started or it may be a loan from the bank but identify all those deposits but you see the deposit where, where does it come out to you it comes out to you right on the bank statement every deposit you made is listed right on the bank statement on the other side of the coin write a check for everything now, there's going to be some times when you say that, well, I can't, I had to go down and get some cash or something. Okay, in those cases, keep, keep the cash receipts. And, uh, but if you just start writing checks to cash and then go roaming around the valley buying things, uh, you're not really helping your bookkeeping system out. The very easiest thing to do for a bookkeeping system is write a check for everything except very unusual items. 
And of course, sometime during the year, you're going to be out somewhere, and you're going to have your personal checkbook with you, and the business checkbook is back at home, and you're going to write a check out of your own personal account. Well, there's no problem with that. Just at the end of the year, go through again and look and see if you have any deductions and put them over on your over with your business account. So the bank is going to keep your bookkeeping system for you right there if you'll just use it. If you'll just use it right, the bank will help you out. Okay, now we could go into all the different aspects of the bookkeeping systems like how are you going to do your sales and, and uh, do you want a cash disbursements journal, do you want a cash receipts journal, uh, how do you want to summarize your balance sheet and income statement. My suggestion to you is don't go to an accountant or don't go to a uh, a CPA to get a balance sheet and an income statement quarterly and then you take it over and you put it in your drawer. <laughs> that doesn't do you any good. I had a guy call me the other day and he had a little business and uh, he said I've got this other guy doing work for me and he charges me quarterly this amount of money and I, all he does for me is prepare a sales tax return quarterly and he gives me a balance sheet and income statement. I said well what do you do with the balance sheet and the income statement? And he said well I take it over and I put it in the drawer. And I said, well, that's, that's okay if you want to do that. But what you just really need quarterly is you need a sales tax return prepared because you have to send in your sales tax quarterly. He didn't have any employees, only had subcontractors. Okay, so what he, what he was doing is he was paying for something that he wasn't using. So as he educates himself more, he should have had that accountant show him how to use the balance sheet, show him how to use the income statement, and gain that knowledge or cut out the service, one or the other. But don't, don't pay for a balance sheet and income statement and file it in a drawer. So your first real thing that you have to have in your business, of course, is, as I say, this separate bit of bank account. And then you're going to come up against the tax people. So you're going to have to file a tax return at the end of the year. And of course, your first form is a Schedule C, which you may have already filed with your businesses if you've been at it a while. Your Schedule C, and you're going to develop that information and put it on Schedule C. Um, or, or you're going to... Uh, need a, a bank loan and then you've got to have a balance sheet and an income statement. Somebody's got to do a balance sheet for you and all the banks have the have the forms. They've got the forms right there at the banks that they'll give you, blank balance sheet forms. So go down to the banker and, and let him give you the form and show you what he wants in the items and and uh, that that's, it brings up an interesting concept in accounting. When you're going for a bank loan you want, to sh you want to show and you want to be able to portray to the banker what all of your assets are at market value. You want to be able to show him that today your, your building that you bought for your business or your home that you bought 40 years ago at uh, $20,000 is really now worth $100,000. So you really want to present a, a financial statement to him or at least in footnotes to the financial or some kind of separate schedule a market value or current value financial statement. Okay, a lot of accountants have problems with this because from day one in our accounting classes, we're taught that everything is, is accounted for at historical cost. So that when you bought that house or you bought that building and put it on your business asset, it went on at cost, and then you depreciated the cost from there. So when an accountant will prepare a balance sheet for you, if he's a good accountant, he'll always prepare it on historical cost. So you'll have a balance sheet, and it will be on historical cost basis, what you paid for it. But if you're going to go get a loan, what you want, if you've got very many assets on there at all, you want on a separate schedule to come up with your market value. And that's, that's what the banker's really interested in. He's wanting to see what kind of collateral has it got in today's dollars, not, not 20 years ago, uh, to make you the loan. But the analysis of the balance sheet and the analysis of the income statement we, our bookkeeping, all our bookkeeping does is get us to a point to get a balance sheet and get an income statement. Then the analysis of those two documents is what's really going to help you run your business and help really help tell you where you're going. And uh, if, you, if you've got an extremely successful business and you want to wing it, why, then you really just have to do an income statement once a year for your tax returns. If you want to start doing it quarterly or monthly, then... Uh, then you may want to try to do that to analyze your business. There are a lot of publications out. Uh, the SBA has uh, free publications. In fact, they've got 20 or 25 different books down at the SBA and, and publications that you should go down there and look through their library, and they're free to you. And they're very fine books on balance sheets, income statements, how to analyze them, and what information they have. But uh, we've got a one that we've put out through the American Institute of CPAs, and it's called What, what Else Can Financial Statements Tell You? And we go into... What is a current ratio? Uh, what are current assets versus current liabilities? 
Your current, asset, current assets are up in the top of your balance sheet, and that's your cash, your accounts receivable, your inventory, anything that can theoretically be turned into cash a year after the balance sheet date. So if you've got December 31st, 1979, and you've got current assets, all those should be able to be turned into cash within a year before December 31st, 1980. Okay, if you've got current liabilities, those are your debts that you owe in the next year, not a 20-year mortgage on your house. You would only show the first year of your mortgage on your house, and the other 19 years would go in long-term liabilities. But in current liabilities, all the debts that you would have to pay, you're obviously your account's payable on a current basis, but any kind of loans or notes coming due. Then what a banker does, he says, okay, this business is going to be able to bring this much cash in the next year, but they've got to pay out this much money. So if you've got $10,000 coming in, but you owe $20,000 of debt, you're, you're in a world of hurt as far as the banker goes because you've got more to pay than you've got coming in in the next year on that, at that one moment in time. And all a balance sheet does is take your business and at one moment in time stop it and say, okay, on this date, this was all our assets and this was all our liabilities, and this is where we really stood. The income statement, of course, gives you the history of what you, how you really did and your sales versus your expenses. Now, so the current ratio, or the ratio of the current assets to the current liabilities is very important to the bankers and the finance people. And they want to see whether you've, you've got enough money to pay off your debts in the next year. And after your business gets going a while, they like to see the trends in your business. Over the last two or three years, have you been paying off your debts, or are your debts growing? And trends are very important for them. Some of the other aspects, of course, are your total assets to your total liabilities. And uh, then, of course, how is your net worth or equity growing or is it decreasing? Are you spending each year? Those are some of just the, the general uh, things about, about a simplified bookkeeping system. Now, we talked about taxes <clears throat> just a little bit a while ago. Uh, taxes are very simple, relatively simple at the W-2 level when you're just an employee. If you get into business for yourself on a Schedule C, there are more things that you can take, and maybe, maybe a fellow that doesn't read a lot about it may not know all the deductions for a business, but he may know. Go to, go to the fellow and see what he knows, or go talk to somebody else or read for yourself. But there are deductions you can take on a Schedule C as a sole proprietor in business that you can't take as an individual and uh, mileage on your cars are better, your depreciation method, and especially one of the big ones is investment tax credit. And as an individual, if you go buy a car, well, that's fine. You buy a car and you get to take the interest expense you paid on the car as a deduction. If you own a business and you go buy a car and the car is used, let's say, 100% in your business, maybe you got two or three other cars sitting around, this is going to be one car that you use 100% in your business. The day that you buy the car, you receive 10% investment tax credit, just as if you're just as if you had had that much money withheld. Say you bought a $9,000 car, you don't have to have paid for it, you just have to sign up for it, and you've got $900 of taxes paid for that year. So that's an interesting little fact of the, of the tax law, and there are many other things like that you can do as, a, as an individual business. You can stay operating at that level as a sole proprietor for many years. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm referring to federal taxes, investment tax. No, you don't get the investment tax credit on the state. Now, let's say you want to go into a partnership. Now, you know, I don't know what the lawyer told you today was the definition of a partnership, but my definition of a partnership is where one man with a great deal of experience combines forces with one man with a lot of capital, and in a very short period of time, they're reversed. their situations are reversed. <laughs> so... Uh, I, I uh, want to caution you about going into partnerships. I am not a, fa a favorite fan of partnerships. I think if you finally gotten to this point in your life that you want to start a little business, then uh, you should go out and do your own thing. But uh, I've seen so many situations where guys have gone into business together, and then, you know, in a partnership, you're liable for everything the other man does. So he can go out without you knowing about it and buy $50,000 worth of merchandise. And not only is your partnership liable for that, but you're liable for that personally. They can come right back and take your house and your wife and kids and everything. <laughs> everything. You don't have anything left. Is so you have a great deal. Part <laughs> Not guaranteed, though. Not guaranteed. 
But that's the, one, of the, one of the problems with a partnership. But that's, that's available to you. And then the next big step up is a corporation. Now, there are a lot of advantages to a corporation that are not available to a fellow in a sole proprietorship on a Schedule C. But you don't really need to incorporate until you get somewhere around 35, uh, I usually use a rule of thumb, 35 to $50,000 net profit because, because of the tax rate structures. On your individual tax rates that you do right now on your individual tax returns, the tax tables go from zero to 70 percent. So if you had enough money, if you were, if you put millions of dollars on your individual tax return, you would come out paying 70 cents of every dollar to the federal government in taxes, because that our tax rate structure is set up that way. Now, however, on a corporation. Well, let's put it down here. Down in here, you may be in a very low level, and you can get down to 5%, 10%, 15%. You can be, be in these very low ranges as an individual or a small business. However, once you start getting above 17% in the tax tables, a corporation starts. The very first dollar of his taxable income is at 17% is taxed and goes to tax. However, the maximum is 46% of every dollar right now is taxed at a corporate level. So... The tax rate structures are one thing. The other thing, unless you need a corporation because of liability problems, because you think that, that you, don't, you want to set something up in a corporation, you see, a corporation is just nothing but another legal entity. It's a separate guy standing right over here, and it's a separate legal entity. And when you own a corporation, you really work for another guy. It's just like working for Kennecott Copper. You just happen to own all of Kennecott Copper stock. So a corporation is a separate legal entity over here, and, and you create another tax return that you have to do, and you create a lot of additional uh, book work, a lot more accounting work, a lot more questions. In other words, you've you're you're got a whole volume of law having to do with corporations because the law is all set up for the Kennecott Coppers of the world. What you do is you jump over in that same ball game. And you're underneath all those laws as a corporation that Kennecott Copper is, only you're just a little businessman still trying to do it all. So you'll get forms and you'll get requests and you'll get all kind of information once you jump into the corporate ball game. However, there are many tax advantages available to corporations that are not available to individual sole proprietorships. One of the biggest tax advantages right now, and as I say, the cost of it is so much, I don't recommend it to you get 35 to 50,000 net profit, not gross, net profit that you're paying tax on. Some of the, some of the advantages are the, the pension plan structures. Okay, as, a, as an individual, if you work for somebody else, and they don't have a pension plan, you can set up an IRA, individual retirement account, and you can go down to the bank, put $1,500 in a savings account in the bank, and you can take a $1,500 deduction on your ta individual personal tax return. That's available to you, an individual retirement account. If you're in business for yourself, you can set up a KEO plan, Name for a Senator Keo that started it. That's the only reason it got its name like that. This is for people on a Schedule C that are in business for themselves. You can set up a Keo plan and start taking 75, well, depending, it's 15% of your net profit or 15% of your net profit or 70, up to $7,500. You can take out of your checking account that you set up for your business, transfer it over to a savings account, for in your own name, you're the only one that can write a check on it, and you get a $7,500 tax deduction on your tax return. Okay, the money's in the Keo plan. Then any money that's made in the Keo plan is tax-free. Okay, there's no until you start taking it out later, later at retirement age. 95% of all Keo plans in town right now put you into a savings account at a relatively low interest rate. There are very few, but there are a few banks in town that will put you into what they call a self-directed Keo plan. 
so that you can put your $7,500 over in the savings account, but six months down the road, if you see a lot you want to buy or a piece of real estate or a tri any type of AAA security, anything that would be a good retirement fund, they won't let you speculate with it, but anything that would be a good retirement type investment, then you can direct your own investments. It's called a self-directed KEO plan. But now here's where a corporation comes in and pension plans. Okay, now in a corporation you can set up a pension plan. Now you go way on up above the $7,500, up to 15% of your net profit, can, or in some cases 25%, depending upon how the profit sharing or pension plan is structured. Now, when you start taking large amounts out of your corporate account, checking account, putting it over in your pension plan account, and you're the only one that can write on the pension plan account, the problem with uh, one caution, um, every insurance company in the world sets up pension plans. And they say, hey, pension plans are great for your corporation. We want, to, want you to give us your money. We'll take it off to New York City. We'll invest it for you. Well, I recommend that you set up your own pension plan and you're the own, uh, your own trustee and you write the checks yourself and you make the investments. Get you an investment advisor. Get, some, get a banker or get a broker or get a CPA or an attorney, somebody to help you, you know, bounce some ideas about where you want to invest the money. But you do it yourself. Don't, don't send it off to New York City or... Timbuktu or someplace like that. Uh, but when you get in the pension plan area, once that money gets over in that pension plan, you start making money over there, you don't pay any taxes. I mean, you are zero taxes. The bracket starts at zero and it ends at zero. Kennecott Copper's got millions in there. Every big corporation in the world's got millions in pension plans for their employees, and they're making millions on it. They're not paying any taxes whatsoever. The same thing is available to you when your corporation or when your company gets to thirty-five to fifty thousand dollars of net profit. Pay those extra accounting fees, pay those extra attorneys' fees, get you a corporation, and you'll get a lot more deductions. There's no need going into all that now, but I just want to kind of give you some ideas. But you're at somewhere in this structure. You're either getting started or you've been going for a little while and so plug into the system somewhere in a group of accountants or plug into the system somewhere in, in what you want to do and uh, you'll, you'll get your money's worth normally. For goodness sake, don't think that the attorney or the accountant and, uh, as advisors are high-priced guys that are just going to take all your money. Or if they are, if they're treating you like that, you need to go somewhere else. But there's a lot of real fine guys that are out there and they have your interest at heart and they're very much professionals and they're much, very much trying to help you succeed. I uh, see our time is, uh, is just about out. Let me just stop for a minute and see if there are any other questions that you might have uh, before we wrap it up here today. Well, I think the most sage advice... Oh, excuse me. At what point in time is it necessary or at what point in time do you feel it would be advisable to turn all of this over to somebody else instead of doing it yourself? Is there a definite well, point? No, I, I, don't think, I don't think you should ever... I don't think you should ever maybe turn it all over to somebody else. You always want to know. You mean as far as just the bookkeeping? Is that what, you're, what you're saying then is no matter how big your business is, you should do it all yourself. No, no, not the accounting part of it, but I, th I think what I want to say, what I'm trying to say is that the control and the knowledge of all of this should always be in your hands. For instance, I just talked to a little guy the other day, and he had turned all of his check writing over to his secretary. He said, just write all my bills for me. I'm too busy for that. I'm over here. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Just write all my checks for me. Pay all the bills. And, and about three or four months later, he realized that she, every time she wrote bills, she was writing an extra $500 to herself. So uh, that she, there wasn't her payroll check. So what I suggest to you is that you always maintain control. Now, they, you, you can let somebody else do the function, but, but, ma but make sure you know. So they, at what point should you do it? I'd yeah. say at, at the point that you can, you can afford it. I, I, th I think at the point that your business gets big enough, if you're, if you're starting to make money in your business, why you should... Uh, and you have a separate business, and you're starting to make money in that business, then I think it would be good to go to an outside advisor because all of these tax changes go to somebody. Go to a bookkeeper or a PA or a CPA or some plug into the system somewhere to get some outside knowledge. Now, you can do all of this book work yourself. You can spread your checks and come up with the total you spent for supplies and the total you spent for advertising and all that, what we call a cash disbursements journal yourself. Just go to a, a CPA and say, show me how to set one up. The guy will show you how to put your column headings in there, and he'll show you how to total it up, and he'll say, okay, go do all this, or you have your wife do it. Bring me the totals back, and then I'll put them on your Schedule C. Plus, I'll tell you all this knowledge that's come out from the, 
uh, federal government. So maybe I, don't, maybe I still didn't answer your question. Not really. There has to be a certain point at which you as an individual is going to be spending X number of hours devoting your time to all of this paperwork. All right. Now that's going to be money out of your pocket if you have to do it. Right. All right. Is it economically, is it more feasible to turn this over to somebody else or to have you, you yourself do it? Well, it's a, if, you're, if you're at a point where you might be able to afford it, uh, hopefully if you could get your wife or somebody and get somebody to advise you how to get, besides you're doing it yourself, because you are the, your own company's best salesman. And you need to not be buried in the bottom of a mountain of paperwork doing, doing detail. If you can be writing, if you can be getting the next sale or if you can be processing the project or something like that. But I would say the time to do it is on May 27th at 10 o'clock. That's, that's as specific as I can get. Uh, now, question. Yes. Well, I think you. And they, when they come and tell us, to tell, I hear the words, well, I can't afford a bookkeeper most of the time. It's a misconception. I think they can't afford not to have a bookkeeper. I think Sam. I think people can do a lot of this on their own. I think it depends on the individual owner and his capabilities. Well, I think your point is well taken because if you're just going to keep all your records in a shoebox or a great big brown paper box and you're not going to know what you've got, and you just, you know, then you really don't have a system, so you need somebody to do the system for you. <laughs> yes, yes. I think uh, I think you'll be able to find somebody that'll do that for you. That's what they're in business for. That's what, you're there for. That's what they're in business for. You bet. I think the one area where we run into people have gotten themselves into trouble is the so many times the small operator in an effort to save a few bucks, and I God, we all want to do that. I'm not criticizing that. Now the youth they relative I think you're listening to some very sage advice from Sam Siciliano, the head of the SBA down here, and one of the ones, the main ones that's uh, responsible for having these free seminars for you. And he sees the results of people coming in for loans with the SBA or, or people coming in for assistance. And he sees the results every day of people that do have bad record-keeping systems or don't really know where they are in their businesses. And so I, uh, your point is just well taken, and, and I don't want to minimize the, the aspect of bookkeeping or accounting at all. But I, I, at the same point, you've got to weigh it with your cost. And uh, Sam's saying if there's any doubt whatsoever, get somebody to help you with it. Well, you mean the bookkeeper's doing them and then you're going to a CPA for other things? Or final monthly, final yearly reports and things like this. I see. The bookkeeper's right and the CPA's wrong. Maybe you won't want to pay the bookkeeper some more money. Uh, <laughs> they they sound, like, sound like she's staying right up on it and he may not be staying up on it. But, but if, you're getting, if you're getting wrong answers, then you need, to, you need to switch. I mean, I wouldn't stay with somebody. Maybe the fellow's gotten so bogged down that he didn't read, uh, read the last month's uh, mail or something. And, Maybe, you know, something, but if he's not keeping up, then he needs, you need to go somebody that is keeping up. Right now in, in Congress, there's something like uh, 1,230 bills before Congress to change the tax laws. 
So uh, the tax laws are changing all the time, and for, for the small guy with the W-2, you're going to read about it in the newspaper, and that's, it educates everybody about the same time. But if you get into business or you get into, you know, you're starting to get anything a little bit more complicated, then you want somebody that's trying to stay up with things or at least is going to research it for you as soon as you have that problem. Well, let me, uh, let me close in, uh, with this uh, sage advice for you. Whenever you're out in business, or whatever facet of your business you're going into, whatever aspect, and you get some of these super salesmen of all time, and you know the poor old uh, accountant or the poor attorney, and they're, they're doing debits and credits, and they learn all of this technical stuff about section so-and-so and section so-and-so. And over here, there's some super salesman. He comes in, and he says, hey, you need to buy a part of the Brooklyn Bridge or something. And uh, you've gotta, you, need to, you need to have, the, I think, the words of uh, Kenny Rogers' song is what you need to keep in mind when he hands you all these papers. You need to know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, or know when to run. Thank you. <laughs> Why don't you all just stand up for a minute and shake some of the kinks out and uh, would you, while you're at it, would you pass that uh, market survey down to your far left so it comes over to this end? Don't forget if any of these forms are applicable to you, you ought to come down and pick them up. Okay, I'd like to go ahead and uh, get started if you'll kind of find your way, wend your way back to the, thank you, back to the uh, seat. Uh, you met rather informally. Mr. Siciliano uh, from the Small Business Administration has uh, had other uh, commitments uh, earlier this morning, and so you you didn't meet him formally, but uh, you kind of met him informally as he uh, spoke here uh, with Gary York. Uh, Mr. Siciliano will be uh, uh, kind of conducting the remainder of this workshop today. He has a film to show you and is going to be up here with the Service Corps of Retired Executives and ACE volunteers to uh, help out. Our next speaker I already introduced to you before uh, uh, Mr. York spoke. This is Mr. Ken Statz with Capital City Bank. He's the Vice President of Loans and has some interesting material for you. So, Statz. How do you know that? Oh, I've heard you before. <laughs> The 
one major fear I always have when I talk to a group of people, the boring people, because my pet peeve sitting where you guys are sitting is to sit and be bored. So if we start getting boring, I'd rather, I'd rather um, talk together for 20 minutes or a half hour and have it be somewhat interesting than take it an hour and find out that uh, we're boring each other, because I don't like to be bored either. My name's Ken Statz. Uh, I'm, a, I'm vice president of Capital City Bank, one of the owners of the bank. I think it might help you just a little bit if you know where I'm coming from. That's what the way my daughter talks, at least. Uh, something about me. I, uh, I worked prior to uh, getting in banking. I was involved with Dun & Bradstreet for about seven years. I started in Salt Lake City as one of those I call them Snoopy guys, the reporter type guys that come around and ask you information on your business. Uh, shortly thereafter, I got in management here in Salt Lake City and then spent uh, some time in South America. I managed, managed the offices in Brazil. And th at that point, that was about eight years ago. I worked for DMB for seven years. I've been in banking now for about eight years. About three years ago, a group of us pooled our resources and our ideas and hopefully our expertise and decided to start a bank. Uh, there are plenty of banks around, but we started decided to start one anyway. Uh, that's been an interesting experience all its own. Uh, we can pretty much talk to each other about any facet of financing or capital, money, that you happen to want to. I think maybe I ought to cover the bases pretty good. But uh, if we get off on a tangent, I frankly don't see any real harm in it. I think we ought to talk about what seems important to talk about. But maybe just to sort of get us started off, uh, capital embarrassingly for us is spelled T-A-L, not T-O-L. When we applied for our charter as a bank, we applied as Capital City Bank and for whatever reason applied with the uh, commissioner, financial institutions, under the name T-O-L. Well, it made no sense at all because capital is the building itself and we wanted to specify capital, you know, T-A-L. And that's kind of an important factor. It's amazing that a uh, a sophisticated lender would make that mistake coming out of the chute. But let's do try to stay informal. And supposedly our approach is to talk about sources of capital and financial factors. And to me at least that translated that means, hey, where do you get the money? And what information do you need to provide to whoever you're going to get the money from to get the money? I'm not trying to insult your intelligence, but I think it's that simple. Uh, there's a lot of false information, a lot of, a lot of stuff that just doesn't make any sense that you hear as rumor about what you have to do to get capital, get loans. Uh, as far, and I'm going to speak, of course, in terms of, of the bank being the financial institution that you would go to to get capital. Uh, and if I were to give one bit of advice in one sentence only and then say it's nice to meet you and walk away it would simply be the Boy Scout motto and that's when you go to somebody and you want capital or you want money be prepared and that's it in a nutshell so maybe that's a good place to quit there's a lot of things to say about being prepared but that's probably the one item when people come to me or my bank or any other bank uh, that uh, it just amazes me. People are not prepared. And I don't think it's because the people are ignorant or uneducated. It's just that nobody's ever said, hey, this is what you need. This is what you've got to show the bank. I perhaps followed our educational system a little bit, plus the banking community. I'm not just, just saying, hey, this is what you need when you go for a loan. The other bit of advice I might give is choose your banker very, very carefully. That's probably easy for me to say because, you know, I, on the other end of the or other side, what do you do to choose a banker carefully? But bankers are just, you know, they're people too. There's some good ones and there's some mediocre ones and there's some that are less than good. And uh, 
try to find one that you have a rapport with. Yeah. Okay, dumb question. I doubt it. <laughs> I happen to agree with you. Uh, basically, on a bank as a bank as a bank, there are a bunch of banks. And in my view, most Utah banks are good banks. They're good institutions. And there's a lot of people that work in banks. But I don't think there are very many good bankers. And I think there's a big, big difference. And I'm not saying I am, other people aren't. I'm just saying, like any other profession, you know, you may call yourself a banker, and you'll know, you'll know. Okay. It may take you a while. Okay. Yes? Basically, you're saying if I go into Bank A and the loan officer says, forget it, you haven't got a chance, I should still go try at least one more bank. Or maybe the same bank. I think I'm a lovable human being, but I've, I know I've had a few people come to me wanting credit, wanting money that found out they can't stand me. You know, they really don't. People, not everybody likes everybody. Uh, maybe they don't like the clothes I wear. I, I'm anti, I don't own a suit. Bankers are supposed to wear suits. Uh, sounds dumb, but I've probably offended people because I refuse to wear a suit. That happens to be pure Ken stats. And a few times I've picked up vibes that some guy didn't like me for whatever reason, or that I didn't like him because that's a two-way street. And maybe it's just me, but I bring that right out in the open. You know, I, you know, I get the feeling you don't like me. Perhaps you'd rather speak to X other person in our organization. I don't say Valley's a good bank necessarily, or wants to go to Zion's. But maybe I'm the wrong person for him to deal with. And I think your relationship with a banker is a lot like a marriage. And I don't mean that to sound corny, but either you have a good rapport with the guy you deal with, or you might as well get divorced. And I, kind of brutal, but I think that's the way marriage is too. You know, either you get a working relationship, or you probably should get divorced. Was that an okay answer to your question? The other uh, factor, another factor that I think is, is important, that at least is important to me when a customer, is, especially a customer that I've never met before, a prospect that I've never met, met is that uh, I'm always pleased when it appears that the applicant knows more about his business than I do. <laughs> because I, I'm not on an ego trip. I don't, there's some lines of businesses I deal with quite often. I'm, I think I am. I'm not an expert, but I'm sure familiar with them because I work with them a lot. But chances are I'm sure not as familiar with your business as you are. And if I am, I'm a little concerned because I want you to know more about your business than I do. I think I should be knowledgeable and I should understand relationships and generalities. And But that's your business. Kind of an aside, one of the Another, one of my pet peeves is for some reason, everybody knows how to be a banker. I have never met a customer, well, that's not fair. I meet lots of customers who think that they can sure as heck run our bank better than we can, and they certainly feel free to tell me. But if I tell them how to run their business, they're sure offended. What I'm saying, I think I have the responsibility to be good at my job. But boy, I think it's incumbent on you to be good at your job too and know your business. I'll try not to offend anybody. I tend to get point blank on things. <clears throat> know your business. Yeah. I'm intrigued. Uh, <laughs> do you, how much, oh boy, that is subjective. How much difference in a, in a banking situation does the banker have? I mean, how much control does he have? Can I take books in the, a balance sheet, whatever, to you? And you look at it and you say, no way, and take it to somebody else, and he's looking at the same figures and say, yeah, yeah, you got something going here. How, how often does this happen, and is it really true? Well, I'm sure it happens. Um, I'm not sure how to respond to your question. I mean, is, is it a wide range or is it fairly narrow? 
relationships, you know, financial information has many things in common. Relationships of whether we're in a, a manufacturing line of business or whether you're selling women's clothing or whatever, many relationships, like the, the, um, the gentleman was up here before talking about the relationship between current assets and current liabilities and uh, the relationships are very similar in most lines of businesses. Uh, I think just like a doctor, if you don't like what I'm telling you uh, on my analysis of your financial information, I think you should have a second opinion and hopefully that would be one of the suggestions I would, I would have. Uh, I, th I think sometimes bankers are not willing to put forth the effort to really understand the business and, its, and the business situation and so either because they say they're too busy or for whatever reason where a second opinion or a third opinion or a, someone else might see it from a completely different perspective. Uh, if you get a lone person that you're dealing with at your bank that's on an ego trip and he wants to play God with you, um, I think you're dealing with the wrong guy. Is that an okay answer to your question? Yeah. I keep listening to your questions and you're a hard guy to give answers to. <laughs> anyway, uh, when, when you go into a bank for a loan, uh, it's, it's awfully important that you kind of are organized in your mind. I'll tell you a couple of dumb things, too. I don't, if, if you happen to smoke cigarettes or a pipe and you're meeting your banker for the first time, I suggest you don't light up because right or wrong, he's going to form an opinion of you. Um, I don't think it's necessary to dress up in your Sunday school suit nor to put on any airs but uh, I think it's important to put your best foot forward. Uh, and I don't mean be a hypocrite. I think it's, I think it's just smart, smart way to do business. But if your approach to the fellow that you want to talk to or that you're going to talk to at the bank is organized, he knows that. He senses it just the way a dog senses fear in human beings. He knows whether you're organized or not. And he knows whether you're on a fishing expedition or not. And if you, if you clearly state what your business is, how much money you need, how long do you think you're going to need it, and uh, how you're going to pay it back, and you know there's a whole bunch of other factors that that you can cover. But if you generally know your plan of attack, your action, um, it lends a lot of credibility, whatever you may say, and the figures that you may or may not have. Uh, along that line, some of us during the course of our lives have maybe had some poor personal credit or we've been involved in a business venture that maybe had some poor credit. Don't let that stuff be a surprise to your banker. Volunteer it. Uh, it's pretty upsetting for your customer sitting across your desk to portray a lot of positive stuff and then lo and behold, when you start doing some independent checking via rumor or, or whatever, you find out that the guy was, wasn't really shooting level with you. It has the effect of saying, hey, you know, I don't think I want to do business with this guy. I'm, I don't really think, I don't think I have negative feelings toward a guy that says, hey, you know, 1972, X thing happened to me. I had some, sh I had some shaky credit. I appreciate that. And I think most lenders, most lenders do. They're not going to throw a rock at you, or they shouldn't. Yeah. I've uh, had a situation in the past before I came to Salt Lake. Um, I needed a loan at one time, and uh, I was a foreign working student with a family at the time, so I didn't have the best credit. I found that if I went to just one of the run of the mill loan officers, uh, I immediately got a no answer. Uh, one particular day, the only loan officer available was one of the vice presidents of the bank. He listened to me, and I got what I needed. You know, is, is this fairly common? If you've got any kind of a touchy background, should you go to the vice president immediately? I, I really don't know. I think that's a judgment call that you've, you've got to make. 
you know, in banking, there's there tends to be a lot of people that um, the attrition in banking, like many other industries, is pretty uh, it's pretty heavy. You know, a lot of people come, a lot of them go, uh, and it's back to the old thing again. There's some good ones, there's some bad ones, there's some that have experience, some that don't have it, have experience. Uh, where possible, I think the I I think where you can possibly do it, you got to speak, be able to speak to the guy that has the authority to make a decision that you don't portray to him what you want and then he has to run to some or go to somebody else and give it again or, or try to reiterate what you said try to talk to a guy that does have the authority to, to make the credit yes In going to a banker for assistance in starting up a new business how much of your own capital should you have in hand and what kind of a package should you lay on it well yeah, the pa I'm not sure what you mean by package. Okay. As far as balance sheet and uh, business plan, uh, location, the whole thing. Okay, yeah. I, I think all facts that you answering you, the f I'll probably forget the first part, but let me answer the second part about the package first. Uh, I think the few items that I mentioned about how much money you need, why you need it, uh, et cetera, is important. But any information that and if you can put yourself in the shoes of someone else or the guy that you're talking to and uh, everything such as, you know, what are the product lines that, that I'm going to carry? Who will I buy mer my merchandise from? Who will I sell my merchandise to? On what terms will I sell my merchandise? Yeah, Sam? Uh, uh, one, one thing that I like to see that I seldom get on a new business uh, is a pro, pro forma information as to anticipated sales, anticipated gross profit, anticipated net profit, and break even point. Almost exclusively, and I quit asking the question, but if I ask someone fairly new in the business or that wants to start a business, what is your break even point? They look at me and they say, huh. And it's really an unfair question. I've quit asking that question, I've learned to phrase it differently because it leaves a connotation that I'm talking down to him, and I really don't mean to. It's just that I think in those terms, and the customer doesn't. But the package should be as complete as you would like to see it as somebody was coming to you for a loan. And I think if you think in those terms, I, I think you'll basically provide everything. Just one second. Yeah. What about a, like a, a new person that's coming into the area that does not have Yeah, and that's a common quandary, and uh, uh, and it's a difficult one once again to respond to because a lender feels much more comfortable if the prospects or the potential customer has some of his so he's playing with some of his marbles too, uh, and it's kind of a personal aside. But my attitude as a lender is a heck of a lot different since we started Capital City Bank because now I'm playing with my money. So I think differently. I'm more cautious, maybe, or more prudent, I would like to think. Where before, when I was playing with commercial security banks money, in my mind, that's what it was. It was monopoly. And the last, and you can kind of do a disservice to your customer for him to develop an attitude that he's playing with monopoly money. I can't say 10% or 20% if that's what you're searching for, but s you've got to have something at stake as well as the lender. I think it depends a lot on your banker itself. You bet. Uh, how long you've been banking with them, how much you've got savings or whatever. You bet. Sam, you better make your point or it's, we're going to forget. Okay. No, this is a question. We have women here today. I think historically, women have had problems. Yeah, 
Yeah, I'm disappointed, and hopefully somebody's got a recorder on, so I better be careful what I say. Excuse me just a sec. Let me answer that. Uh, I think we're still doing kind of a disservice to the ladies. Can you still hear me if, if I'm... I think we're still doing somewhat of a dis... Isn't it? I'm just keep wandering around. Uh, I think we are still doing somewhat of a disservice to the ladies, and that's pure kin stats talking. Uh, and I can give you a couple of examples. Uh, I happen to be a strong advocate of, of SBA, Sam, so this kind of sounds off, or comes off sounding a little bit negative, but the, the loans to the women, for example, that is being advertised or made available, uh, what is it, eight and a quarter percent or eight and a half percent with a maximum of $20,000 under the SBA program. It's a neat, neat program, but there's no money there. Right. You know, it's hypocritical. And I think, I th and that's what I meant by my first comment, is I still don't, th I think we're saying all these pretty things about giving ladies the same opportunity, but maybe in some areas aren't really doing it. And I happen to be somewhat, I, I, I'm not too old yet, I'm 38 years old, and I find myself being prejudiced, not I'm not talking about lady type prejudice now, but I have some prejudices built into me, and we all do. And and I think I have to make when I have an applicant from a lady, I have to consciously. I sh probably shouldn't admit it, but I have to consciously remember to look at this, all the facets of that request that I would with a man. And I. Th vain enough to think I'm doing a very good job at, at doing that. Uh, we could probably go on a long, long time about, about ladies' loans. Unfortunately, most loans that, I, that come to my bank that are woman-oriented loans or that the woman wants the money, unfortunately, I've had the definite feeling in many, many cases that that woman was playing on the very fact that she's a woman. And that ain't playing fair either, friends. Because I mean, I mean, I no, kind of poor me, yeah. And you know, I better, I better shut up while I'm semi ahead. <laughs> there, there is some of that though. I, you get, I get the same thing with, uh, and I'm sure you've seen it, Sam, or other people that are involved in lending. When a minority group, an honest to God minority group comes to me, sometimes you get the definite feeling, here I am, poor me, you've got to help me because I'm a minority. Sometimes, too, uh, I think you both found where that particular person is front, maybe, or something else. Yeah, you have to be darn cautious of that, too. We've had a lot of husbands all of a sudden running in to find to borrow money for the business and their wives' maids. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, I have a, a, at least part of the answer, maybe. I, I find out in my few applications of loans over the years, my business. I think the reason there's no money in that program that you just mentioned, one of the reasons, there are many reasons, is the bank, mostly the banks, find more feasible to lend half a million dollars to those big. Uh, Yeah, perhaps. Uh, I think, fortunately, at this stage of our development as a bank, I'm not in that situation. My legal lending limit is $120,000. My average loan is about $16,000. So you, what you say may have some validity, but it sure doesn't in my case because of pure lo logistics of the... I, yeah, I, I hope you're wrong. <laughs> Yes, sir. How much weight do potential investors or shareholders have uh, when it comes to acquiring a loan through a bank? Um, it'll be. You walk up and uh, you say, well, this person and this person and this person have stated that I'm able to get the funding through the bank and get the business under motion or whatever. They'll be more than willing to 
invest this, this, and this, but they just don't want to flat them out and invest it unless they know that I have the blessings of the bank. You don't follow. You don't mean you don't mean as guarantors. You mean as a, as investors. Right. Not guaranteeing a no. loan. I I must. I lost you, right? Yeah, you lost me. Okay. <laughs> you go to a, a banker and you say, "I'd like to expand my business, or I'd like to start it up. I, I need X number of dollars capital, right? I have this person and this person and this person who have said that." Once I get it under motion, once I get it going on down the road, they will be more than glad to buy 30 shares or 50 shares. Of Speaking for myself, it would have very little weight. There's no weight whatsoever in that. No, I didn't say that. It would have, it would have not much weight. It judge the credit on its ability to generate income. Uh, it should be capitalized, well capitalized going in, adequately capitalized. With me personally, it wouldn't carry a lot of weight. It would carry some weight. Yes, ma'am. What are some of the reasons you turned down? <laughs> <laughs> for the, for the, oh, I am for the very same reason they turned down that gentleman's loan or that one or the exact same reasons. Well, they aren't any different for women than they are men, you know. For sure. Yeah, I, for sure. Uh, you know, if, if a gentleman... I mean, really, if you don't have that much in your name... You don't believe me, do you? I mean, say you're married, you know, and everything's in your husband's name, but you've really cleaned house the last year or two, you've changed things to your credit rating quote, uh, you've bought a little property, uh, you're looking pretty good. So you go say, how about a loan? Well, For a, I'm, I keep being afraid I'm not answering any of these questions. Not any different for a girl, a female, as opposed to a male. The same factors are taken into consideration and weighed the same. Not yet. There might be a first time, I don't know. No. You know, I've, I've got a friend that I've got a friend who's a director of our bank that that is a very very well-to-do individual, and he spends a lot of his time being bored. He's not a very old guy, but he's he's just bored. He doesn't have anything to do with his money or his time. So just for kicks, he lends money to people once in a while, acquaintances or friends, just to give him something to do, keep him out of the bars, I guess. And uh, this guy came to him that he'd known for a while, and and wanted to borrow ten thousand dollars from him. And he agreed, ended up agreeing to lend him the money and found out that the reason that the guy wanted to borrow $10,000 from him so was so he could get out of town. Well, he lent him the money only to realize that now the guy was out of town and he was one of the guys that he was getting out of town from. And I, and I think, well, enough, enough said. Did you my I don't know. I asked the question again. Now that the criteria is the same, I've never yet gone in the other room and laughed. I would kind of get a kick. I wish the situation would come up because it would be a fun story to tell. <laughs> yes, sir.
I agree. You're dealing with you're dealing with human beings, and they. That's right. Uh huh. I. I'm sorry, I didn't understand that. What line of bit? Yes, and the loan officer uh, say, well, uh, she has a beautiful power to go into that place. It can make a big difference, you bet. And I think you do come down to the personal thing. Once again, I don't mean to beat it to death, but I've been burned a few times on, on restaurants, restaurant operations. Uh, when I have a restaurant loan request, I'm still smarting from one. You know, I'm still hurting for a beating I took on a restaurant. I am at this point somewhat negative about financing restaurant operations, so I refer that loan request to somebody else who doesn't have the prejudice that I have. Now, hopefully, I'll mature out of that. Oh, it's horrible. Yeah. 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 I'm. Uh, I probably ought to find a better word than prejudice because, it, but you do have favorite lines of businesses that you've either had good experience with or bad experience with. Yes, sir. I think that's that's unfortunate. I know that happens. Well, did you apply for an SBA guarantee loan through the bank? Well, yeah, well yes, I have, but right now it's pending. Well, but now you've applied for a direct loan from SBA? That's what I'm getting at. Yeah, maybe it's, maybe it's hindsight again. <laughs> I think maybe you should have talked to another bank, and you're saying they you tried and they wouldn't talk to you, isn't? Well, they said first thing, you don't bank here, you know, but you know everything works really good, you know. There's nothing we can do because you're new business, you know. They said that we just prefer not to go up. Maybe you might find somebody to give you, oh, maybe ten cents on the dollar for the amount of collateral that I have. Well, I don't, you know, yeah, I'd have to look at the whole picture, but I think you try and try again. Yes, sir. So another hypothetical for those situations. Uh, if I go into a bank, I've got no collateral. I'm starting up a business. Uh, I've got a good idea. I've got a forecast with $100,000 sales in the first year. And I've got actual uh, tentative orders. And I need $30,000 to start up. Is that a reasonable thing to, to look at, or do I have to actually come up with the, at least half of that? Yeah, I think it's a reasonable thing to look at, but it's impossible for me to make a judgment or anybody else without really knowing all the facts. Because, you know, lots of times you end up, you, you get people that come to a lender, whether it's me or anybody else, and they've got a nifty idea, but it requires my money. And, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and it's back to this gentleman's question that he asked earlier is it's very, it's important psychologically, it's important uh, just prudently that the applicant is investing something also that he doesn't want to lose. Dollars, hard, something. Yeah. Do banks have statistical information which indicates if a particular line of business uh, is going to make it or not? You or bet. Come under SBA. No. Or to come under both. Well, there's there's several sources really. Uh, you can. Pre 
contradict with the exception of the human element, and we'll never get into talking about the things I wanted to talk about, but you, yeah, you can predict within very general guidelines, but you sure as heck know, as Sam mentioned, that restaurant business is a tough, tough business. Is it available to the public? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, one of the publications of Dun & Bradstreet, and I get, still get some things from, from DMB, which is, they'll give you a copy if you go in, it's called the Business Failure Record, and it'll certainly tell you very quickly what lines of business are more hazardous than other lines of business. Where would you pick that up at? Dun and Bradstreet, and I can't, I can't remember their exact office address now. It's, it's in the phone book, 352 South 3rd East or something, something like that. Uh, well, anyway, enough of that. Well, uh, lots of people can. You know, the bank can, sure. He's not insured, but... Oh, no, not for the loan loss. No. That's, that's the way it is, baby. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, and I, geez, I hate to avoid that question, but I'm gonna because it just requires more than more than we've got. I just, just give me a perspective for the future. Is it getting better or worse? Well, let me answer it a different way, okay? And if it doesn't satisfy you, please let me know. A word of advice, and I, I don't know if there's other bank people in here. If there were, they might throw a rock at me or something. But if you're ever declined, with the exception of SBA, because they have a dollar allocation on certain types of loans, but if you're ever declined at a bank and they use the reason, we don't have any money, challenge them. Don't let them get away with that crap. Because what they're really saying is they're saying they don't want to lend you the money, but they haven't told you why. And I think you deserve to know why. There isn't a bank in Salt Lake to my knowledge, that couldn't make almost, well, make any loan within their legal lending limit if they wanted to. Don't buy that from the banker. I've used it before. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you why I've used it before. Um, it's a kind way of, of declining people. Pardon? But it's a cop-out. I think I owe it to a customer to explain to him the reason I'm declining him. And the reason I've used it from time to time, you know, I don't have the money, is because he's completely unreasonable, he won't listen to what I'm saying, uh, no matter what I say, he's not going to believe me, he's not going to accept it, and a final frustration is, hell, I don't have the money. And sometimes they say, yes, you do. And I say, <laughs> Well, I don't. It's, it's not, it's a cop-out. It's not an honest statement, and I think you deserve an answer. But if you ask your banker the real reason why, have the guts to listen to what he says, or else don't ask. <laughs> and hopefully he'll have the character to be honest with you, not rude, but honest with you and tell you, you know, you're crazy, you're up in the night, <laughs> you're projecting... Well, again, I don't mean to be facetious, but I, I think I owe it to you. I think money lenders have more of a responsibility to their customers than just renting them money, and that's all money lenders are. But I think you have more responsibility than that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, would you tell us a little bit about your interest rate on your facility? Sure. You know, that's an open-end question, but they'll range anywhere from prime plus... Um, in my instance, the bulk of my commercial business loans will run anywhere from the prime rate plus 2% to a prime light rate as high as 4%. What's prime now? Give you an editorial now. Uh, I mean, t I held our prime rate at 14.5%. I think we're the only bank in Salt Lake that's at that rate now. 14.5% uh, I held my prime rate. Fifteen and a quarter is prevailing prime. But I did 
Yeah, I did it. Well, Salt Lake is using the same prime. I did it for very good reason, and it's a personal reason in that we we are not money borrowers. We are not borrowing from the Federal Reserve. We're growing very rapidly. We've got plenty of money. So if you come to me for a loan, you can call me a good damn liar if I say I don't have any money. <laughs> <coughs> but we, we felt we could justify not increasing our rate. I think we cannot go past this quarter without coming up to the other bank's prime. I, you know, we just can't hold it much longer. We want to make a profit, but we don't want to make an inordinate profit. There would be a different rate for different collateral, right? For different collateral, for different length of time, you know, that the money would be repaid. Uh, depends on the term, again. If you're talking a five or seven year loan, no, ma'am. Six months to a year. Six months to a year, you'd probably be thinking in terms of prime plus two and a half. The longer the term, the higher the, uh, the rate? Well, there's a lot of variable factors in that, too. Uh, yeah, as a generality and a response to your question, yes. It's terrible to speak in so many generalities. As far as a banker would be concerned, they'd rather see a two-year note at a higher return and maybe go in refinancing it later than a five-year note to start off with? <laughs> Tough question to answer again. In my situation, I want sh the shorter the term, the better is what I like in my situation. Now, other banks will have their own philosophy of lending. They'll have their own policy. For myself, I, the shorter the term, the happier I am. That's because we're in a growth position and we want to turn our money, we want to serve more customers. Is five years a long you? Five years is about as long as I want to go now. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. You said at the beginning, Yeah, the uh, you know the, the balance sheet that we you know that's been alluded to I'm sure several times a day, and the the uh, profit and loss statement. In the case of a new business, you're not going to have a profit and loss statement based on history. You're going to have a profit and loss statement based on what you anticipate for the future. Uh, I think rather than just talk words to the banker, I would suggest that you write it down in some sort of logical format that you have a balance sheet and you have a profit and loss statement, that you have a list of people that you think you're going to be buying from, and that you have a list of people you think you're going to be selling to, and that you know what your selling terms are. Uh, that you uh, have your personal financial statement uh, as well as the, the business balance sheet that we're talking about prepared and ready. Because if you don't, you're either going to have to take the time to fill it out while you're sitting there with the bank person, or he's going to give it to you and say, here, fill this out, come back later. Uh, and try to put yourself in the position of somebody coming to you to borrow money, to borrow money from you, and what information would you like to have from them? Uh, I don't mean to oversimplify it, but uh, common sense is a big, big factor. Yes, sir. Say it one more time, okay? What knowledge do you have about finance companies? Oh, finance companies? Do they have some connection uh, in, with the banks through our loan dealings? For instance, say I walk into a finance company because I was rejected by a bank, right? <coughs> I know that I have to pay 25 or 26 percent, but uh, this is supposed to be. Oh, you, probably. Yes, he's probably borrowing his money. My question is, why the bank reject me and a particular finance company to give me the loan? Perhaps because the bank is either prohibited by law 
or bank policy from charging you a rate that they think that should be charged on that credit. So consequently, they say, hey, rather than charge him 20 percent, we'd rather tell him not make the loan to the company because we don't want to get the reputation in the community of charging rates that are finance company rates. That's a strong possibility that would be the reason. Well, probably not. It's probably that the finance company is borrowing its money from another bank, but not necessarily. There's no relationship between the finance company and the bank. Uh-huh. I think if a credit union says that, they probably don't have the money because they're dealing on a completely different, different, yeah. That's my opinion. Have we beat it to death? Hope it didn't bore you. Pardon? Any other questions? Because I'm going to quit. It'll vary from bank to bank. I, I think I mentioned my happens to be, you know, we're a new bank. We're only about three years old. My average loan is, I think, about $16,000. I'm talking about business loans now, which is awfully small. You know, I have loans ranging up to $120,000, $100,000, with overline accommodations with other banks, up to a quarter of a million, half a million. But as far as, and that would not be true of for security. Their average loan is probably whatever it is, $80,000, $120,000. I don't know what it is. But in my situation, it's about sixteen. I have about 340 loans on the books, commercial loans. Is it better to go to a bank where you're going to be locating your store, or is it better to go to a bank that is out of the area? In my opinion, in the location where you uh, are going to be doing business. Oh, one other thing I think is darn good advice, and then I'll shut up. I recommend strongly that you deal with one bank and one bank only. Well, there are a lot of reasons. There's a, one of the, the prime reasons is the banker feels much more comfortable if he, has, if he can feel your pulse, if he knows that, that you have the confidence that what you're portraying to him is the way things are. Yeah. Okay, again, it's, it's that truth that you were talking about the very first. As long as you're up front with your banker, hey, I've got my personal account in Valley, I've got my business account in Science, I've got, I've got another personal account at Heritage. As long as we're up front, and he knows where you're coming from. And that's, it, that's his decision. Uh, you know what, I'd, I'd probably tell you if you told me that exact same thing. I said, hey, why don't you move all your accounts over here or maybe you ought to do. Well, I don't buy that. <laughs> or maybe you ought to do all your banking there. And there's another thing on loans, that especially borrowing money. I'm not speaking of deposit. There's a, there's such a thing called a philanthropic borrower, and he's not very large, but he's got lots of banks, and he borrows a little from you and a little from everyone else. And this way, if he goes under, he feels that none of you will be hurt too badly. <laughs> That's one of the reasons. Yes? One more question. Uh, uh, they didn't know they made any. They might. There's, uh, I've never heard of it. Yes, ma'am. No, the mechanics are the same. Thanks, you guys. Yeah. If you're, I'm not here to hustle business, but if you're interested in a card, I'd be glad to give it to you.
I've been asked to take over for Bob Cox because he did have to leave. I'm Sam Siciliano with the SBA. It's 3.15. Now, we, have, we had scheduled a film on, a, on business location. Are you going to run the film? Yeah, I'm going to. Frankly, I have to take the blame. Our agency didn't get the film here in time. Well, it isn't even here. But we have another film that lasts about 13 minutes on advertising, which I think would be of interest to most of you. Is that okay if we play that? Yes. Okay, fine. And then after the film, the formal part of the workshop is over. However, uh, we have, have three, two or three of our volunteer score counselors that have promised to be here that will be very happy to give you personal one-to-one -one counseling if you'd like it, or we can handle it as a panel and just shoot the breeze and ask, ask any questions you may have. We'll just do it any way you want. If you want personal counseling, you take, go in a corner with one of our counselors and he'll be, he'll be very happy to try to help you. Well, we don't carry the films in our office. We have to order them specially just for workshops. But uh, we may have some of the films we also have in cassette form. And we do have, I think we have the cassette on location in our office. And we have a player. If, you, if you'll just call us. And if we have it on hand, we'd be happy to throw it on our little Fairchild. TV screen and play it for you in our office, or anybody else that's interested, the one on location. I think we have it in cassette form right in the office. Are we ready? See where I'm going to step so I won't break my neck. Okay. Yes, I'm Jim, right? I'm Ron Jackson. I edit the Parkville Neighborhood Times just down the street. <laughs> well, I'm very pleased to meet you, Ron. I'll be glad to introduce you around. Just say the word. Well, that'd be fine. I'd appreciate that. I'll tell you what. The Times could run a feature story on your opening. Help get you started off. Uh, next week, isn't it? Yeah, open Tuesday. The story would be nice, Ron. I'd, I'd appreciate it. Oh, it'll make a good tie-in with your opening day ad. Ad? Oh, <laughs> well, well, to be perfectly frank, Mr. Jackson... I'm not sure we're going to be doing much advertising. On the other hand, maybe we should have a small announcement ad, but just an inch or two. Maybe you'd rather not do the story. Oh, there's no strings attached to the story. We'll do that. Look, I didn't come over here just to sell ad space. You may never have occasion to use this, but of course I hope you will. Well, if I ever do run an ad, you'll get it, okay? No. If you ever decide to use us, I hope it's because you're convinced that we can reach your clientele. Do I uh, sense that you don't believe in advertising? Oh, I think advertising's fine for the, for the name brands I carry. But for a little guy like me, I, I couldn't hope to do much with it. Not with the money I have to spend. Say, well, would you like to take a look around? Sure, I can get the story while you show me around. But I warn you, I'm going to try and change your mind about advertising. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Having the prescription counter at the rear will pull the people past these selected sundries and notions. 
And that way I'll get a chance to sell them coming and going. That's well thought out. You must have good experience in this line. Mm, almost ten years. I'm a graduate pharmacist, and I work for General Drug in the city. I learned a lot. But I've always wanted to have a place of my own. So, here I am. Jim, one thing I'd like to get in the article is just what goals you have for the business. Goals? You know, what kind of establishment you want this to be. <laughs> well, that's easy. Successful. I want to make money. <laughs> yeah, I know. But I mean, from the community viewpoint, what image you want them to have? Oh, well, I feel that people want a drugstore they can trust. And that's more important than prices. I hope we can convince people that we care about them and that we're very careful in what we do. Good points. How are you going to get them to believe it? Well, the only way I know is to be that kind of a store. If we do all the things we reasonably can to be careful and helpful, well, they'll get the message. I'm sure they will, in time. I'm hoping to help it along. I'm going to have employees who are interested in customers and show concern for them. Impressive. I hope you can find some. I've got two already. But I'm still going to pound home this theme of customer service and meticulous care. And then they can get the message across to the customers. You know, not just say, uh, I'm sorry, you'll have to wait for us to mix your prescription. But we're very careful about prescriptions. It takes time because we check every single step. Word of mouth sales promotion, huh? Oh, I see it coming. Advertising <laughs> again, right? You caught me. The point is, you're planning quite a lot of advertising. When you consider the great ideas for displays, the store layout, and the signs. Oh, point of sale advertising. Well, I'm all for that kind of advertising. But the other stuff, nah. I just can't afford it. Jim, you may find you'll have to afford it. The question, seems to me, is how are you going to get people in the store? <laughs> And the fact is, Jim, that very few people just happen in. That's how Ron Jackson and I became friends. He really gave me something to think about. Of course, I was pretty stubborn about it. Until Ron told me about a local merchant. Well, he didn't think much of it. Like you, this guy started out with all the drive and enthusiasm in the world. And people liked him once they got to know him. Now, this merchant didn't go out of his way to get customers. He, too, thought they'd just happen in. And a few did. When people did come in his hardware store, he did a pretty good job of personal selling. Of course, satisfied customers tended to come back whenever they needed anything they thought the store would have. Occasionally, a customer would tell a friend. By and large, not enough new customers came in to replace those that had moved away or were attracted away by strong competition. But a business has to have trick. So the proprietor cut prices drastically instead of figuring out how to attract more customers. Well, this only hastened his ruin. And finally, the things he did have going for him began to fade. Less time and money spent on the store's appearance. Sloppy habits crept in, and without prospects for growth, good employees left. It wasn't long until suppliers withheld credit and support. A lot of hopes, dreams, and money went down the drain. The business failed. And Jim, this should be of particular interest to you. You see, that hardware store was in this building. Ouch. Oh, I won't say that you can make it just fine, but your chances would improve with a little intelligent promotion. Well, sure, I know it can happen. But maybe something else was wrong with the hardware store. Jim, the sad fact is that about 400,000 firms go out of business every year. The three main reasons are lack of capital, lack of customers, and poor management. Everybody knows about capital and management, but that getting in the customer too many people think there's some magic in just opening a door and hanging a sign. Something exciting has to happen between customers and a business, or else. Okay, you've made your point. All successful business has to have some kind of advertising. Well, let's say some kind of sales promotion. That covers advertising, too, of course. 
The sales promotion includes all the techniques which expand sales. Well, look, how about a cup of coffee? We've got some fresh. Sure, sounds good. What bothers me is some ads don't seem to work. Just waste money. I'd hate to run an ad that didn't make more sales. No, don't get me wrong, Jim. There are bad ads. Some, I suspect, do more harm than good. How do you know the difference? Well, there are a few good rules. And you can get good advice. <laughs> Look, I advise my clients on what I think will work. It certainly doesn't help a newspaper to run bum ads. Mm. Okay, uh, just for discussion. Suppose I did run an ad. Can I expect direct results? I wouldn't count on it. You wouldn't. Then why advertise? <laughs> That's a mistake many small businesses make. They run one ad and then sit back and wait for the cash register to ring. If it doesn't, they blame advertising. Or oh, the fellow that helped with the ad. I'll say. You see, advertising works when it's a repetitive process. Each ad builds a little more the image of the store and its products. Very few single ads prove to be bonanzas. And there are other factors. More variables? I'm afraid so. A while back, a furniture store decided to have a special. So they took a full-page ad featuring studio couches for $118 each. Only thing was, somehow the newspaper makeup room mixed it up with another ad, and it came out two for $118. Well, the store policy was to back ads no matter what. But to everyone's amazement, not one single customer showed up. People will not buy regardless of price until they need the product. The ad was worthless then. Oh, hardly. Later in the season, without more promotions, the store set a sales record in those studio couches at the regular price. Well, how can that be? Well, there's retention value in ads. I don't know. How does an ad work anyway? I mean, what makes people buy? Well, people buy to satisfy a need, real or imagined. Where they buy depends on their idea of where they can get the best value, service, and side benefits. Ads are an extension of selling technique. An ad has to first get to the customer's attention by some device that stands out. Then it has to appeal to the customer's need and give some information about how to satisfy that need. But especially, it must identify the place where you can satisfy the need. But you still haven't met my number one objection. The cost. Well, I hate to repeat the old saw, it takes money to make money. <laughs> but whatever I spend, it's just that much more added to overhead. Well, so is rent. Don't take my word for it. Look at the larger successful businesses. Uh, yeah, but they can afford it. They're big enough. Well, how do you think they got to be big, Jim? I don't know of any successful business that didn't promote somehow in order to grow. How do you know what to spend? Mm, well, I'd suggest you talk to your local trade association. But I can tell you that... Uh, all small retail stores spend an average of nearly 3% of last year's net sales on promotion. That much? And most of it on newspaper ads. <laughs> <laughs> it isn't important where you spend it as long as the medium works for you. As to the amount, well, base that on your own requirements. How stiff is competition? What are the local buying habits? How fast do you want to grow? Well, if I could only do it without the added cost. Sure, that'd be great. Even better not to have to meet any payroll costs. But you can no more afford to lay off advertising than you can competent help. The cost of lost sales would be too damaging. Percentage of sales figures won't help me much. So far, I've got zero sales. Jim, where would you like the business to be in, say, two to five years? As big as it can reasonably get. Well, you'll have to be more specific than that. Advertising, Jim, like all management decisions, should be determined by your carefully planned realistic goals for growth. Promotion is how you do it. Well... You make it sound pretty good. Maybe I should try it. But, but what about all the guys that are successful without advertising and uh, sales promotions? There are some. Yeah, well, they're only successful by default. Let a sharp competitor move in on them and poof, another store building for rent. But more importantly, Jim, any business can do better, no matter how successful, by improving its advertising. Advertising won't solve all your problems. It won't improve bad service or poor products. But it can make a good business a whole lot better. But the expense of it. I just don't know. Mm, can you afford not to? Good advertising will pay for itself. 
And it's one of the ways in which you can compete with the big operators. Maybe. But the big boys have the experts. You can be an expert, too. And you can act a lot more rapidly on decisions. And there's plenty of help you can call on through trade associations, the government, professional journals, and suppliers. Well, I'm sure going to try to make this an important store. Then how can you lose? Resolve and enthusiasm count a lot. Ron, I've got an idea. I've got an idea for an opening day ad to appeal to, to the growing families in this area. Now, since this is a new store, what would you think of a new baby theme? That's good. You know, featuring baby supplies and trailer trees? Yeah, you could have a display up front. And that's the story of how I answered the advertising question. It was a very good answer for me. Good idea, you know. I don't know that that was Academy Award caliber, but uh, <laughs> I think there's some good basic information there. I I got to put in my two bits worth. I'm I'm a firm believer in, in advertising and promotion. I think without it, uh, you can't really do much. With one condition, though, you know you can spend all the money in the world promoting and advertising, but if you don't deliver, then you are wasting your money. And that's probably, in, in my mind, the, the biggest problem in the United States today is this whole area of service and the way people are running a business, uh, lack of service. And I think all of us experience every, this every day. You walk into a, a store, you're ignored, uh, nobody waits on you, nobody even tries to sell you. Now, I don't like to be high pressured, but I like to be sold. Or you call a service organization, call someone for service, and uh, how many times has it happened to all of us? You know, they promise to be out uh, the following Monday. Uh, they never show up, uh, don't bother to call, and you wait days and days, and you, you start begging to get, get the service. In fact, uh, there was a very interesting article in U.S. News and World Report here about a year and a half ago, a feature article of several pages that I think kind of hit it on the head. It, the name of the article was uh, Service with a Scowl. And that's about the way far too many businesses are operated today. And you look around this town, and I, I've seen a lot of stores, particularly in retail merchandising, in the area that I am particularly interested in, fold, and I uh, am not a prophet, but I could have predicted that they wouldn't last uh, right off the bat, just the way they were taking care of the trade. I happen to be a, I use the term clothesaholic. I've got a couple of sins. I, I'm a glutton. I like to eat too well. And I'm uh, an impulsive spender and buyer of clothes, whether I need them or not. And I walk into some of these stores, and I've, I've seen it happen. To, I can name three right here in Salt Lake that were fairly nice stores but you just didn't get the service when you went in there. Nobody, nobody would even wait on you. And I've seen them close. I tell one personal story. I went into this clothing department of a downtown store. It was a department uh, that had many other departments in the store, and I was wandering around. Finally, the fellow came over to me and asked if he could help me, and I'd been looking at suits. Well, almost everything in that store was a European styling. Now, most of you men, if you know, uh, you know how the European styling is cut. If you wear a size 40, in European styling, you got about a, you got to buy about a 48, you know, just to get into it. And I just commented to him that I didn't see anything that would fit me. I, and I kind and I kidded. I said most of your suits here are for are for kids. And he looked at me right in the eye and said. No, sir, we buy our clothes for men that keep themselves in shape. <laughs> you know, so uh, he, lost, he lost me right then and there. But I'm running off the mouth. Uh, I'm looking. I, I see two of our counselors. 
Dick and Norm, would you like to come up front? Perhaps we can just treat this a little bit as a, uh, a little panel type. Feel free to ask any questions. If we know the answers, though, we'll certainly try to answer them or answer them. If we don't know it to, or have the answers for you, we'll admit it. Dick Haglin is was part of our one of the instructors earlier today, he's a professional management consultant and also at the present time is director of consulting for the Small Business Development Center up at the university. One of our volunteer counselors for the Small Business Administration. And Norm Fitzgerald is also a volunteer counselor for the he's chairman of our SCORE chapter. SCORE stands for the Service Corps of Retired Executives. And these men and women serve as volunteers, unpaid, to act as consultants and advisors to people either going into business or people in business that may have problems. So uh, let's just open it up. Uh, we can run a little while here and try to answer some of your questions. So, well, who's first? This man here. Excuse me, as I mentioned earlier, if you'd rather have, you know, personal, private counseling, one of the gentlemen would be very happy to confer with you privately. But if you'd like to make an open discussion, that's fine, too. That's cool. Okay, it good. Fine. Fine. Okay, I've been in business myself for, what, seven, eight years. Uh, recently, I, I boosted the thing and gone into heavier. I have never done any advertising as such. I was strictly word of mouth, uh, get customers to talk to other customers, and personal contacts. Uh, I'm wondering how I can find potential customers in a highly selective field without blasting advertising to 99 people that could care less. In other words, you have a limited market, so to speak, specialized. Uh, what, what, is it a service or a product? What do you do? Uh, it's a service and a product. I sell composite film for, to make advertising brochures for printers use. For the printing trade? Yeah. But I can, I can, my customer can be a printer, he can be a manufacturer, or he can be uh, almost anybody interested or a jobber in the printing trade. No, I wouldn't think so. I would, I'll, I'll defer to them in one minute. My first comment would be to, isn't there a uh, trade publication for the printing industry here locally? If you advertise in their publications. Okay, maybe that's the way to do it. Uh, Dick, would you care to comment? Well, aside from the from the trade journals, uh, there are papers in the that uh, advertise generally to business people. Now that narrows your field from a general readership publication like a newspaper, but you can get. Uh, Aside from, from narrowing down to uh, a trade journal or a general business publication, direct mail is the only one I know of. 
you have any other ideas, Norm? Well, I was going to go along with Dick on the direct mail after a careful uh, screening. Since you have such a selective market, your sources for screening are probably better than just, say, general sources as well. Well, not, maybe, maybe not, because, okay, his suggestion, go to manufacture, or pick up a manufacturing list. Uh, chances are even a, a manufacturing company, unless you're talking about something like, or like Desert and Industries, well, wait, that's not the name of the company. Desert company? Hyperdermic needles. Desert, 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 Desert Pharmaceutical. Pharmaceutical, yeah. yeah. Well, I think his suggestion was to uh, list, the direct use direct mail directed to the people in the industry that you are dealing with, not necessarily all the manufacturers in Utah. The, the directory, trade, go, excuse me. The directory manufacturers is, is uh, categorized in three different ways. One is uh, alphabetically, the other is by SIC code. Are you familiar with standard industrial no. codes? No. Well. It's a four-digit code that tells you what kind of business they're in. And in the front of the directory, it explains uh, the first two digits really classify it broadly as a metal manufacturing, uh, wood products, uh, paper products, and so on. So you can pick out the product, the manufacturing type. And the third way is classified is by size. And it tells you whether this particular company is in the size category of, uh, I think, big old... 1 to 9, 10 to 24, 25 to 49, 50 to 99, 100 to, to 199, by number of employees. You can get it from the uh, Utah Job Service. Department of Employment Security. Department of Employment Security, yeah. Of course, I, I think in all honesty, any type of advertising you do of this nature or, you know, almost anything, uh, you've got to anticipate a certain percentage of duplication or perhaps wasted effort. I think your large advertisers that hit the mass media, you know, they'll, uh, they may send out thousands knowing full well that perhaps 80, 90 percent of it is wasted, but it's wor worth it to them if that 10 percent uh, responds. You, I think you're in a little uh, unique type of business too, with a very limited market, and maybe you're maybe you're doing well the way it is too. Well, I think the area I think the area of direct mail, yeah. How about your sales technique? Uh, how do you conduct your sales? What's your sales? Technique? Do you ever go personally? Oh, yes. I think that's still better. Telephone's good, but I think person to person is still the best. And set up an appointment and then go. Yeah. That, of course, you know, if, if it's within, uh, if you can generate the business that way, probably for the type of service and the thing to do is as good a way as any. Because then, then you're very selective and your rate of success is as high as your ability of sales and the requirement of Going. That does, of course, limit the amount of contacts you can make. Well, yeah, I've got other things to do. You've got other things to do. Well, 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 maybe you should hire a salesman. Are you in the yellow pages? Mm, no. no. Uh, <laughs> I think you ought to be in the yellow pages. Yes, yeah, with that type of service, the yellow pages is a fair effort. And, and the trade journals. Uh, and direct mail by, <laughs> by selected basis, too. I mean, you know the customers you think you can sell. Uh, you know how many you can't get to, so let them know about you as well. I think he had a question first. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, in dealing with Valley Bank on my financing net, uh, and uh, Sir Losey, you probably know him. Yes, very, I do. Very helpful individual. But he suggested in our general discussion that uh, maybe I ought to go up to uh, management services and have them help write uh, the proposals and, uh, and things like that, and that they might. 
benefit in this area? Is this a, a good correct statement? Or? Uh, within limitations here. Now, when you say, you mean our management assistance department in SBA yeah. come into us and have us write your proposals? Give you some suggestions and count. yes, that's what we're there for, either internally with our own staff or the volunteers. I, we we did slip up today. We should have had some of our requests for counseling forms in the material that was handed out. You could fill one of those out and you know and send it into us, and we'd try to uh, select a score counselor to help you. That's another what well, we goof, but yes, you can contact us for help or just call us. We'll make you a request for counseling form. And we get it back, we'll make the assignment and in writing to you. And the, we send you a letter notifying you of the name of the counselor and the phone number of the counselor. And then it is your responsibility to call the counselor and arrange for a meeting with he or she at a time that's convenient to both of you. I think you are next. I would say, and this is a, an assumption on my, on my part, that if you're actually involved in the assembly or preparation of the, some of the products, you would need a health food handler's permit. If you're buying it from another supplier already packaged and then selling it over the counter that way, you wouldn't have. But to clarify it, it's very simple. Call the Board of Health and uh, tell them what you're trying to do, what you intend to do, and get an answer from them. I don't know that any of us can give you actual percentages with respect to the mortality rate. I think such figures are available, maybe from Dun & Bradstreet. My observation is that the mortality rate for health food stores has been quite high in this area, maybe more so than in some other areas. Would you gentlemen want to comment? Associates, I'm not sure that casualty rates are in there, but uh, that gives you some other percentages that you can use uh, that, uh, re to relate to advertising. But the advertising guides start with the three percent that was discussed here. That's a yeah. fairly standard figure. And you should yeah. have some sort of a, either a, a pro forma statement or an operating statement at this point in time, that, uh, or your estimate, best estimate thereof. Uh, and then I would personally crank in some startup advertising. Uh, that I felt to get the ball rolling. Uh, there should be some front end loading on it, I would think. Yeah. Well, I think more important than the mortality rate, you don't want to be one of the statistics. You want to be a, a, a successful store like this guy in the movie. And that depends on how well you do your planning. Do you check the location? Make sure you get the, the right location for that kind of a store. Do you know where the competition is? Do you know what the uh, population is in your trade area? Do you plan your advertising, both the uh, media advertising and point of sale advertising and whatever else you do in the way of promotion? Uh, you can beat the statistics if you do a good job of planning. It's the fellows that don't plan that are in that uh, percentage that fail every year. And you uh, can get material, incidentally, on uh, location of stores, on how to do a good display in your store, uh, pointers on personal selling. You can get that kind of material from the SBA either in the SBA office or up at our office at the university. One other thing, I'm almost certain Bank of America publishes one of their management booklets on health food stores. 
Now, Bank of America publishes a series of management publications, general type management, uh, you know, financial statements, uh, financial analysis, planning, and so forth. Then they get into specific type businesses, and they publish booklets. And I think they're about $2 a piece, and I'm almost certain they have one on health food stores. And in general, their publications are very, very good. I have to admit they're even they're better than SBA's publications. No, you'd have to. Uh, we have a, in our office, we do have the Bank of America Index, which is a list of all our publications, and there's an order form also. And you'd use that. You can, you'd have to send in to San Francisco and order it from them. Yes. The one that runs what? Well, you had, in order to go to the bidding uh, place, you know, what you bid uh, for the material and everything else, I had to be affiliated with the Utah Steel Association. It's a big uh, association of all the steel manufacturers around uh, Solway County. The county told you this? Yeah. I don't know. I can't answer that. I would say that you would be governed and regulated and required uh, to get your licenses from the Department of Business Regulations, which is a state agency. Almost anybody that has anything to do with the construction industry in Utah or s subcontracts and so forth are regulated by the Department of Business Regulations. Would you agree? Yes, and, and you would be required to take an examination yeah. before they give you a license. That's your, I think once you get that uh, and satisfy their requirements, uh, But the Steel Association, I don't know. I'm not aware of that. Don't know who they are. No, I don't either. There's an association of contractors. Have you been to the Department of General Contractors? It's a big national organization. They have a Utah chapter. Yeah, and that's and that's voluntary. You can join that, or you don't have to. I don't know. I'm afraid I can't answer that. But uh, if you you haven't been to the Depart Utah Department of Business Regulations, that's your first step. Be approved by them and licensed by them. Yes. What's the advantage or disadvantage of uh, the sense of, say, an uh, advertising agency um, as to giving you advice and counsel? Is it cost worthy to go to them? Are they professional enough to give you the advice to tell you where to spread it? Or, you know, effectively place your ad? Well, advertising agencies are like lawyers. Uh, you can go to a single individual who practices by himself, and uh, he can be a very skillful lawyer or advertising man, or he can be somebody just starting in the business. And you can go from there to uh, law firms with 26 uh, partners in them. And you can go to advertising agencies with 26 people in them. Uh, it's like picking any other kind of a, of a consultant. Pick him out for because you can talk to him and ask him what he can do for you. Let him show you what he's done for other people. Let him show you samples. Get his price list. Uh, talk to him and get some preliminary advice from him. And I think most advertising agencies will give you that kind of a story without any charge. Then you make up your own mind whether that particular agency can do you some good. I think particularly important <coughs> dealing with an advertising agency too would be to follow the advice that the banker gave you. Be prepared to discuss your problem. Know know your markets. Uh, at least be pre what you think your markets are. Uh, be a be prepared to present what you think would work from your experience, or if you have no experience, what you think would work based on your own personal feeling about your business and uh, your reaction to similar advertising. They will then they should give you the what has proven. They should have the expertise to give you what has proven successful with other similar businesses. 
give you a little more specific information on the demographics and such as were mentioned in one of the other discussions of the area. Uh, and if your ideas are well founded and then direct you to the proper, uh, maybe the proper types of advertising, the proper sources and that there. So they're basically fairly worthwhile. If, if they're within, the, if after you talk to them, they're within your budget, then uh, they answer the questions. And like, and like finding an accountant or a lawyer if you find the right one. check with the uh, public agencies. A lot of them are on contract services. Uh, uh, so the public agencies that deal with that type of service, and in your case, I would check with the, uh, the public welfare people, maybe uh, uh, Granite Mental Health, we work through the public welfare people as well. But there are some private agencies, as you probably well know, in town. Uh, but uh, that's, uh, uh, that's what I would do. If I go into this, I'm going to go into the uh, private sector. Mm -hmm. and, uh, well, it's, it's a... It's What's the service? It's a, it's a consulting service in the Alcoholics. Well, we have, we, of course, we have the highly successful Utah program, which is the cottage program, and we also have the commercial Raleigh Hills, uh, among others. And AA, and there, there are a lot of social... Or information. Uh, the VA hospital has one of the finest programs in the city as well. They would probably tell you other people who are doing it. Or if you personally acquainted with some physicians, you might ask the physicians if they know of other services. You said you should go to an advertising agency that uh, works in the same line that you are in. What Conflict of interest does this bring up then? Well, I think that was said that you should go to one that has conducted programs in that area. Uh, I don't think you've got a real conflict of interest there. Yeah. You're going to tell me if you were getting $100,000 a year from a company and some guy came in in the same line of business, so I'm going to give you $200 a year? If well, if they're, if they're in the business to develop accounts, uh, they want all, all kinds of accounts, large and small. That's what they're in business for. Yeah, but are they going to give you the same overall concern for your $200 that they've given that business for $100? Well, I think you get what you pay for. Of course not. They're not going to give you the same effort for the person that's spending ten, five times more. But I think if they're knowledgeable in your field, they can do a better job of advertising for you than another firm that isn't familiar with your type of business. A good example of this is in the accounting field, as an example. Now, most CPAs are good accountants, and they have a full knowledge of accounting. But the accounting profession is almost becoming like the law profession and the medical profession. Within these professions, they're, they're, they're specializing. For example, I know one CPA firm here in town that does a lot of accounting for a lot of nursing homes. They like it. They know that business. They developed a lot of good accounts in nursing homes. Well, I don't think it's a conflict of interest. They're doing a good job for all of them. If you're talking about a new business, a small business, and a small advertising budget, I wouldn't go to one of the big advertisers. Uh, 
perhaps the most qualified agency in, in Salt Lake is David Evans, which is a, a national firm with offices in about 12 other cities, but locally headquartered here. But I wouldn't go to David Evans with an advertising budget of $500. Well, I, don't think, I don't think David Evans would handle anybody in this room. I, but I'd go to one of the you know, they're too big. Over there. How close uh, should the competition be to a new store, your own store? I mean, uh, like a store that I want to open, I don't know whether the competition should be 25,000 miles away or five miles away or what. I, I suppose it would be pertaining to the area, the geographic area, and the amount of people. But and that's one. One thing that's uh, bothered me a little bit uh, is the place that I've chosen has another one that's in a mall that's not too far away. I don't know whether that's something I should look at more seriously or not. Same kind of a store? Uh, not exactly the same. Okay. It's not exactly the same. The probability is that you'll do better in that kind of a location because people will go to one store and not find what they want and go to another store. Part of your traffic will come from so-called walk-by traffic. They'll walk by your store and see it and be attracted by your display and walk in. If it's exactly the same kind of a store, I wouldn't want to be next door to it, but uh, I'd want to be in a, in a neighborhood where there are other food stores, for example, because you're going to get a lot more walk-in traffic that way. So you mean like grocery stores? Yeah. I think you'll notice quite often uh, you'll find a cluster or an area of businesses all of a similar nature in a particular area. And it, the, the thinking by many people, and I think there's a lot of truth to it, is that they all help draw for each other. If you notice, certain, you go down State Street and all of a sudden you've got used car dealers one after another in an area. Or restaurants, or streets that are known as Restaurant Row, where you'll have in a two or three mile area, you'll have one restaurant after another. And it seem, they seem to help each other quite often. Thank you. Thank you. I'll mail you the application. OK, we'll take maybe one more. Yes, ma'am. I mean, they don't have it. Kennecott doesn't have the program anymore. Oh. Did you have another question? No, that's fine. Last question? Yes, ma'am. We we can't bypass you. Go ahead. Um, what about a motorcycle dealership? Would that be the same as a car dealership? Should it be on the road with the other motorcycle dealership? 
Oh, I don't think so necessarily. I think uh, accessibility would be very important and parking facility for the customers and and certainly not buried or out of the way, I think, in an area with some traffic. But you've got to be careful with traffic, too. Many times you don't want too much traffic. Like, example, I don't consider 7th East a good retail street. It's almost a freeway, although there's a lot of traffic there, but I don't think I'd want a store along there. Uh, to answer your question, but they may have some different... Uh, apparently the same general principle does apply. Wrights, who are right next door in the very same building it, with BMW. They're both very small agencies. Uh, I don't know how successful they are. I think Wright is quite successful, and the BMW has been there for several years. Uh, from that standpoint, uh, I would say, at least in that instance, what has generally been said still applies. Uh, we found some that have moved quite a bit, uh, but most of them are generally along State Street within a few, not a great many blocks of each other. That's a good point. Okay, well, thank you very much for attending the workshop. Uh, what is your particular problem so we know who to talk to? <laughs> or come on down to the boat. Can I ask you a quick question, please? Sure. If you were to take a hypothetical situation with a yellow page advertisement, right? When a person looks at the yellow page, is it because automotive repair or is it because it says uh, most prices in town or what the only thing is the area that I've picked out is on 17th West. If you were to just automotive, you mean automotive repair or automotive lock system? Uh, would it because automotive would it be, would be a general automotive uh, regular motor repairs right, and having, uh, also uh, part of the building what would it be that about the locks that locks that mm -hmm. more or less have a customer you know, the thing is about a block away is a, a automotive repair shop to that particular yeah. ad itself they would be the, the only two for a uh, number of uh, uh, blocks actually the closest the um, West Jordan what about ads or Riverton. Riverton. if you're going to have a, a display ad I don't think that'd be. I'm just giving my own opinion, and I, you know, may disagree or I can be wrong. I'm wrong lots of times. I don't think that'd be a big factor. I think the important thing would be the area in general. Uh, if there's a lot of, in other words, you think you've got a good good market out there, and is your shop going to be where they can see you? You know, where you're not really buried and out of the way. In other words, you got a certain amount of traffic and visibility. If there's another shop, a couple of, what, what's your budget? a few blocks away, I don't think that's a big deal to worry about. Not so much that I can go <laughs> to. I was just thinking, uh, listening uh, to the reason just I about you what's your budget, you similar find all three the same the business. Now the locksmith can be no problem. Uh, no, in fact, I don't know if there's anybody out in that area at all, is there? No. In fact, there aren't too many in Salt Lake. Uh, no, the, the posts, uh, if I'm doing burglar alarms also, there aren't any burglar alarm installers in the whole area. Uh, as far as Larkson is concerned, the closest would be um, Midvale and West Jordan. And actually, there really there isn't anything in West Jordan either. Rivertown and uh, that's about the closest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I don't I seem to be too many. I, I just conscious of that a couple of weeks ago. I had my wallet stolen. Stolen was on a Saturday. Thank you, Justin. Actually, a key case. With all my keys and my ID cards and everything else in one case. I was scared to death. I didn't want to spend the weekend. Uh, here's a guy's got my keys and my cards and my address and everything else. And I tried to find a locksmith to come over on a Saturday. To change the locks in my house, you know, so I finally found something. I had to pay time and a half. Got a guy out of the home, but as I as I remember looking at the yellow pages, there's not too damn many yellow uh, locksmiths in that way. Yeah, well, it's uh, uh, they're not too abundant. This is true. And uh, I actually I'm debating whether I should try to combine the two businesses or just. Uh, Leave it at locksmithing. Where do you uh, Where do you start? Actually, with some advertisement, uh, I, I haven't been doing any advertising. With advertisement, I think I'd have all the business.
guess I could handle it myself. You know, however, you know, you know, yeah, however, I was, uh, I'm running the business myself right now, uh, but in the automotive, I'd probably hire one or two people on that. Yeah, and that's when you, to a certain degree, start asking for troubles, you know. When you're hiring people. Right, but I could, there's no way really to take care of no, too. No, I'm not saying you shouldn't, but the minute you become an employer, you're, you know, you have the headaches of an employer, and there are reporting requirements and the taxes to them, there's payroll and everything else. And also, when you're not physically there to supervise the operation, you got problems too. That's right. That is difficult to answer. I think it's a personal decision. Uh, I would be tempted to say that maybe stay with the locksmith in business and try to expand that and build that up more and get good automobile repair shops are hard to find too, you know. Uh, today, uh, there aren't too many good mechanics around. Uh, a good mechanic with any kind of a shop at all, uh, if he treats his customers right, he's going to have more business than he can handle. Well, the reason I uh, I was considering this. I I do have a fair background in automotive. Yeah. But have you got the background in the new engines? They tell me it's a whole new ball game. These, uh, uh, you know, fuel injection, electronic emissions, and the computerized systems and everything else. Uh, as, as much as anybody else has. <laughs> that seems to be a problem because they're, they're not except for some of the dealers who are training their people, and you wonder how good they're training them. Well, I, I do have the expertise in it. I, uh, I'm certified nationally in automotive uh, mechanic and also a truck, truck, truck mechanic. I do have the expertise in the field. Uh, but the, the shop that is, uh, like I say, a couple blocks away from the site, Shucks, he could have so much business he wouldn't know what to do with it. But uh, here again, he's, he's been pretty uh, shoddy in his yeah. uh, That's the point I'm making. So. I'm fully convinced that a good repair shop uh, anywhere in this valley, you know, at least a half decent location, can make money. Because this well, gets back to what I complained about earlier about the service, you know. You talk to people, everybody says, God, I wish I could find me a good mechanic that I could trust. Not so much the money, because we're all paying through the notes, but uh, you still don't seem to get the work with you. I, uh, when I do have time, I, I do a little bit, uh, which I don't have much time on, but I do a little on motor right now. And, uh, yeah, shucks, I have people coming from all over the valley that I, mm -hmm. that, uh, I've done work for. Well, it sounds like that's something you ought to really get, maybe get into. Sure, let's walk up towards the front.
partner that they find out who they do any local business. Certainly if they do local business, so I mean that would give you, you know, one additional in and go to uh, go to the school supply if you to Idaho or Pedro find out if they you know if, if you're searching to find out if it's available or if it's a call that you are to determine if there is a one. Go to those places that would normally service the schools on a limited supply. Excuse me, do you need me? No, oh, Sam. Sam. I don't know if anyone wants to talk to you or not. Not tonight. Thanks very much. I, I don't know what happened to a couple of the others who were supposed well, to. Well, Wynn was here, but uh, he didn't want to stick around. You know, some of us. What the hell did he come out for? I don't know. I didn't say. I'll try to get up to the office tomorrow with those uh, those notes. Oh, okay. Or, you know, next week. Make whatever is best for you. Okay, I got them pretty well done, but uh, I want to check some information with you and get them typed up. Okay. Sometimes, sometimes under brand name listings, they're listed in the full in the yellow pages. Yes. Distributors and such. I think generally speaking, what you'll find is, uh, I mean, most small businesses starting out, and correct me if I'm wrong, your credit, the, the, the credit situation is the thing to look at first. They'll sell to anybody that's off, you know, that's in a position to retail their product. But you know, uh, to starting out, you'll probably be on a cash basis or COD basis. So it'd be item for item. In other words, you want to sell an item of theirs, and you buy it from them, and then you have to put it on display. Right. It, there's, they won't most have items. you an inventory. Signing space is probably not. We don't get on much of that on, on the type of stuff that you might be handling. Now, if you found a manufacturer of some, some sort of an exclusive instrument that was trying to break into the market, you could probably get, get him to put it in there on consignment to see how it goes if you were established or if you had opened your doors. Mm -hmm. uh, you might work that out. But on, on a big company where you're a small portion of the market, Some of your brochures there. Are, they, are you going to leave those there? Yeah. Let me, leave let me have a few. You want some? How many do you want? Oh, that's good. Just some to carry with me. 